councillors and the members of the public. I hope you're uh, all back with us now. I'm going to start straight away with item seven. It's a decision item. And this is the report of the Leader and Cabinet for Decision. It's going to be introduced by Councillor David Fothergill, the Leader of the Council. I'm going to invite the Leader of the Council and there will be opportunities for members to ask questions as part of each item for decision. The Leader will outline that this report has two matters for decision. One, that is one Somerset, local government reform in Somerset, and two, the Treasury Management Outturn 2019-2020. I now invite the leader, David Fothergill, to speak. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Um, this is a big day for the Council and it's a very big day for Somerset. I want to first of all start out by thanking all those that have been involved in drawing up this this business case and all those who have made the time and the effort to read it and take part in the surveys and the research and to ask the questions and to attend the many meetings that we've held and i think by now we've we've held nearly 20 hours of internal meetings uh, explaining the business case relating to one somerset so so i would hope that all members uh, have had opportunity to ask the questions that they want to ask and I know that the offer has been made by, by the program director, Carlton Brand, um, and also the finance uh, director, uh, Jason Vaughan, to ask any further questions. I know that no further questions have been asked since last week. Uh, I'm not sure that as councillors we have spent so much time and effort on one single issue before, certainly not in my time as councillor. In terms of our formal meetings at Cabinet, scrutiny in this council, we've spent those many hours looking at the case for change. In terms of councillor briefings, I hope that everyone has found those useful as we've inter interrogated the fine detail. In terms of councillors reaching out to city, town and parish councils, I know that my group members have really worked hard to enable councils to feel involved in this process. And at this point, I'd particularly like to thank the Somerset Association of Local Councils, who have organised a series of events, including one last week where I spoke to 35 parishes and the week before where there were further 30 parishes and towns, um, and giving us the opportunity to, to talk to as many people as possible about the one Somerset business case. Just for our just for our own council, by the end of this meeting, we will have debated those to, uh, debated for over 20 hours. It shows a huge commitment to giving people the opportunity to share and to shape the document and to get it right for Somerset. There are a number of key tests that we need to pass. One of those is our vote here today. This is one of the most important votes in Somerset County Council's history. This is effectively saying that we are prepared to see this council being dissolved, along with the four district councils and a new council being established. That is a significant vote that we are about to take. I would remind the public and all those attending this meeting that moving to any new unitary approach is not our decision to make. This business case, if approved by this council, will then go to the government uh, for the Secretary of State's ruling. He will call for other business cases from districts and, and other interested bodies to come forward. And I really do welcome other bodies coming forward with other ideas. I've always tried to engage and to, uh, to encourage debate. And I would like to see that debate continuing. Even if this business case is voted through, there are alternatives which need to be brought out into the open and alternatives which need to be discussed. So it's important to understand what test the government will apply and require us to meet in our first Somerset, in our one Somerset business case. First, there is the need for a unitary authority proposal to have the right size of population. A minimum of 300 to 400,000 is preferred and was restated only last week by the Minister. Our proposal is for the whole population of Somerset, around 560,000. So that's a very big tick. Interestingly, if you divide Somerset into two, it doesn't achieve either half that 300 to 400,000 preferred minimum. Secondly, there is the need to show what's called a good deal of support for the businesses. Uh, so, deal of support. 
for the for the business case. By that, the government wants our MPs, our key stakeholders, our business leaders, organisations like cities, towns and parish council, as well as continuing support from residents and communities. And I believe that that is another tick. Mm. I will ask Councillor Faye Purbrick to go into more detail in this area during this debate. But I do want to thank Froome Town Council, who have hosted a number of events and have coordinated questions along with Somerset Association of Local Councils. The third test is around the need to show that local people will have more to say in the decisions that directly affect them. That is the cornerstone of our business case with more input from communities, more opportunities to have real influence in their patch. It is a key element of our argument that local people should have the chance to run local areas. That's the third and a very big tick for us. Three ticks for government getting it right for Somerset. There have been questions and there have been disagreements. Of course there have. I would remind those, including sadly, or some, uh, one of our own district councils, that it is not about the money or one council taking over others. It is about putting in place something that will last for a generation. This is the first time that local government reorganisation, if it is undertaken, will have been seriously effective since 1974. And it will benefit all of our residents, all of our businesses and all of our communities. It's not just savings. It's about local voice. It's about ending confusion, not just moving from five chief executives, five back office teams, five sets of contracts to one. It's not just reducing waste and duplication. It's about a single powerful voice to lobby government. As a number of Somerset residents have said in the survey answers that they've given, please just get it right for Somerset. The principles, I'm sure all councillors and all our public are very clear and easily understood. I do acknowledge. I do. Ac OK, thank you. I think I'm just being interrupted at the moment. Apologies, uh, leader. We were. Uh, I've just been informed by our uh, our IT there's been a uh, a slight break in the live stream for members of the public who are viewing. Uh, I just wondered if uh, if we could just pause a moment just to allow for confirmation that that, uh, that live feed is reconnected and working. Uh, apologies for the for this, leader. You may wish just to uh, just to recap. Certainly for the last. Uh, Got Scott. Can I just say that I've had, I have had a. Best May I obviously uh, receive a repeat of that. I'm just conscious about those people receiving the live stream who are now very interested in, uh, in hearing the leader's uh, speech. Yeah. Scott, well, yeah, it's just not obvious to join again. It, what it says is um, you, you have to click on the live now to go back to watch it live now, and it's not obvious. So the numbers drop from 55 to 22. So it's just to make the public aware. They then have to, after the break, you have to go on and click live now. It's quite a winded thing to do if you don't use it often. Sorry to butt in, I just wanted you to be aware. Where do you click on live? No, Alan, no, not you meeting, it's for the YouTube people. Anyway, it's now, I've looked at it now, Scott, it's uh, yeah. now working. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. We're just having that confirmed by the technical people at this end, but I think I think your techni technical knowledge um, is probably far and above most of us. So thank you for that. Um, Scott, the monitoring officer, I, I will continue. I noticed that uh, we did have uh, one member drop offline, so I will just recap um, briefly what I said. Uh, I won't go back through the three big ticks for government because I think that is, uh, is very clear and we've talked about that. But I would say that it's not just savings, it's about local voice, it's about ending confusion, not just moving from five chief executives, five back office teams, five sets of contracts to one. It's not just reducing waste and duplication, it's about having having that single powerful voice to lobby government. So as a number of Somerset residents have said in their survey answers, just get it right for Somerset. The principles I'm sure all councillors and our public are very clear and they are very easily understood. I do acknowledge that some people will have reservations about change. Change can be quite frightening at times. I do get that. I do accept that not everyone will agree with this business case and I understand. I do 
completely agree for the need for questions and consultation in the coming months, and I am absolutely committed to that. But the principles surely are all what we agree on. Ending confusion for the public, getting it right for Somerset. More community involvement, getting it right for Somerset. Ending the duplication we all know exists with five sets of teams and getting it right for Somerset. Having a single powerful voice to lobby government and to fight for Somerset. Getting it right for Somerset. And making the savings that will enable us to fast track some of our key priorities like apprenticeships, like tackling climate change, like investing in health and well-being, like getting the right housing for Somerset's needs. It's a long list but we can make a real difference. Again, we can get it right for Somerset. We are here to put aside our differences and instead to work together to make the first steps, creating a way of working that will bring real benefits to our residents and to create the opportunities to invest in key services, not just current Somerset County Council services, but those across all authorities in Somerset, all services within the new unitary authority. Should this business case be approved, I will commit to a far reaching and comprehensive program of engagement and consultation to involve all those who wish to. I invite councillors from all political parties to contribute to this and we will make the resources available. I would be absolutely delighted if leaders from the opposition parties would come together with me to form a cross party approach to how future government decision making would be implemented in Somerset. We move to a new phase after we take this decision today. If we take this decision today. I make this offer because we have an absolute duty today to get it right for Somerset. This is a momentous day. That's what I have fought for over the past three years. That's what this business case lays out and that's what I believe we all want to achieve to get it right for our residents, to get it right for our businesses and to get it right for Somerset. I'm delighted to propose this paper and I'll call upon Faye Perbrick as my seconder for the recommendations. Councillor Faye Perbrick, please. please. Sorry, Chair, having some problem with my mute button. Um, Absolutely, I'd, I'd love to, to second this motion to take forward the one Somerset proposal and reserve my right to speak later in the debate, please. Sorry, Chair, did you get that? Speak in reserve. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to now invite the debate on the amendment, after which we will take the vote on the amendment. So, Councillor Bloomfield, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Off, please. Good, good afternoon, members, as it now is. Um, <clears throat> I've always been in favour of unitary authorities. In fact, from when I was elected, over three years ago, it was one of the first things I raised as to why hadn't this this project actually proceeded further. I was interested by the leader's comments just now, and I think to some extent it rather shoots the fox of some people in that those that say I'm in favour of a unitary in principle, I'm just not in favour of the one Somerset plan. Um, I attended South Somerset District Council, I think it was about two weeks ago, and quite frankly I was I was fairly appalled by the response of that district to the, the county, the one Somerset plan. Um, it wasn't so much a response as a rant. Um, rarely have I read such a poorly written document. As I said, I was, I was somewhat embarrassed to have my name associated with it. Um, so I'll keep my point short here is I am in favour of unitary authority. I think the one Somerset plan, uh, it's a far from perfect plan. But it is a plan. And as David Fothergill recently said, if the Secretary of State approves this business case or approves the principle, then others can submit business cases, which really does, as I say, shoot the fox of people like SSDC and others who say, yes, I'm in favour in principle, but not this plan. So now they'll be able to vote with their conscience and vote for the unitary authority and submit their own business plan. 
Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I have several councillors now coming up online. The first I see is Jane Locke, Councillor Jane Locke. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, as I understand it, although that seems to be a, a more general statement, um, we are now just debating the amendment, yes? Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very interested to understand a little more about the future consultation. I think we're all disappointed that the people of Somerset didn't get a say in this so far, and with only 500 uh, residents having been asked their opinions so far. Um, I just wonder how much more we can do to make sure that everybody in Somerset has a say on, as David has, or the leader has said, is one of the most important decisions this council will have ever taken. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Locke. The next question so, I've got sorry, is... Chairman, can I respond to that question? I, I, would ex I think that uh, Jane would expect an answer from me on Certainly, that. Chair. Certainly, Chair. Uh, Certainly, Leader. Thank you. Uh, Jane, I, I think, as, as we've discussed before, um, the, the process of preparing a business case, submitting it to the Secretary of State and thereafter is very well defined. Uh, and so what we've gone through until now is a, a process of engagement. Uh, and it may sound a very different technical uh, thing, but we've been through uh, engagement and the, the work that we've done with the 350 people that we've talked, 500 people we've talked to in the 350 businesses has been about uh, really research into how we build that business case. When that business case is submitted, provided full council votes it through now, that will go to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of State will determine the consultation process. And I think that's really important where we then start consulting much more widely. We'll move into a whole new phase of, uh, uh, of engaging not only with, with our, our consulting, not only with our, our, our residents, but also with our businesses, with our partners, with, with everybody that's got, that's got a view in, in this. And that is what the Secretary of State would expect us to do. So, so uh, we have not got to the consultation phase yet. I must stress that we have been through an engagement process to enable us to draw up a business case, which we will then submit. Uh, the consultation, I think, is, is the exciting bit, which will come and it will be determined by the Secretary of State, as it would be for anybody else submitting a business case. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. Before I take the next question, and uh, Councillor Adam Weathercott, can you please turn your video off? That's Councillor Adam Weathercott, please turn your video off. The next question comes from Councillor Liz Leishon. Sorry, Chair, I was premature. I wanted to ask a question on the full business case, not the amendment, so I'll step back now. Thank you. Thank you, I noticed that. In that case, it'll be Councillor Bill Revens, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for bringing me in here. I'm so, I'm somewhat concerned about the uh, sweeping powers that we are giving to the Leader of Council to submit further evidence by this amendment. I'm sure Mr. Fothergill is an honourable man, but it gives us a little bit of concern that he can submit any further evidence without it coming under any scrutiny by this council, either at a scrutiny meeting or a cabinet meeting, or indeed full council. Um, my concern particularly comes from having read the uh, your Somerset publication and the survey that was contained within it, uh, which I've had a number of, of, of academics contact me to express their, their, their concern that, that this is not an unbiased way of collecting data and supporting a case. So I, I would really want to understand what powers we are giving to the, to the Leader of Council and what scrutiny powers we have. This it appears to me too much like a blank check. Thank you. Councillor, Councillor David Fothergill to respond. Uh, 
absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Bill, for raising the matter. Um, this was a very late amendment coming in, and I, and I think it's there primarily because uh, the letter from the Secretary of State hasn't been received yet. It will be received very shortly. Um, we are uh, uh, indicated that it, it will be with, here within the next few days or certainly the next week. So it, it's really important that when that letter comes that we, we've, uh, we've got slight flexibility in how we respond. Um, so the business case, as we will vote on today, will go before the, the Secretary of State. Um, any further supporting evidence in terms of information coming out of engagement or consultant consultation will be submitted because clearly this will be ongoing until the autumn. Uh, and any changes, any specific requests that he, he asks as a result of us submitting that business case, it just gives me that, that flexibility to do that. Um, of course, all the information that is uh, submitted to the Secretary of State uh, will be um, published uh, and will be subject to to review um, as uh, as we go through the process. So I don't think that it's uh, anything more. Uh, and I thank you for your kind words about uh, having faith in my honourability. Um, but it is nothing more than allowing us some flexibility because that letter has not been received, uh, uh, and we are um, conscious that it will be here in the next few days. And we may need to 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 do something more, not do something less, but actually do something more. I don't know if the monitoring officer would like to respond at all. Right. I have uh, several people waiting. The first is Councillor Adam Dance. Councillor Adam Dance, can you hear me, Adam? Yeah, my questions for the next item, not the amendment. OK, thank you very much. So if you, if Lee Redmond, please. Councillor Lee Redmond, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Evans um, made my point. Um, I, too, am a little bit concerned that with this amendment, it, uh, uh, it gives uh, the leader, not that I mistrust him in any way, the opportunity to add to the business case, which is going to be potentially before full council in a few minutes. And um, I would like, well, I would like to have some clarification as to to what, because surely if the business case as it sits is, is supported and goes to the Secretary of State, one would assume that any amendments or additions to that would have to go through full council to be submitted as well. I'm not saying that that's what I'm calling for, but the statement as I read it allows the the, the leader of council to add to a business case which full council hasn't voted on. I, I think I think if I could respond to that, Lee, and then I will hand to the monitoring officer because clearly the, the wording has been through him. It's not, it not it's not asking for me to change the business case because I can't change the business case. I think it's asking for me to supply um, any um, further information which arises after we have voted it through and also to respond to the specific requests of the Secretary of State. Um, so we don't have to, uh, if you like, come back in September and have the vote uh, in terms of uh, supplying further information. I think I think it just gives us the opportunity to respond uh, to the Secretary of State's invitation. I don't know if but I'm looking to Scott, which we can't see because he's behind a big screen, but I'm, I'm looking to Scott to see uh, if he'd like to add to that. Thank you, Leader, and again, thank you, Chair. Again, just to respond to the questions, uh, you're right in terms of, particularly in terms of the wording itself. Uh, I think the wording is hopefully trying to clarify that uh, the effectively the delegation to the Leader of Council is about subsequent information that becomes available after this full Council meeting. So, subject to the Council agreeing the proposed submission of the uh, business case to the Secretary of State. In due course, as further engagement or supporting information or further consultation results come forward over the coming weeks and months uh, and ahead of the next scheduled full council meeting in November, this is a practical delegation which would allow the leader of council to provide such evidence through to the Secretary of State. I think it's quite common, particularly uh, with uh, these sort of proposals, uh, following their submission to government, for government to then subsequently ask um, potentially some further questions. Uh, this delegation is really uh, providing for uh, 
the leader to respond on behalf of the council uh, and obviously to also provide any other salient information uh, that becomes available in the subsequent months. Uh, it is not designed uh, by wording uh, to amend the approved business case. Uh, clearly, my reading of the, uh, the recommendation is it's about providing supplementary evidence and information. And I hope that helps uh, provide assurance to uh, both Councillor Revens and to Councillor Redman. I believe we're, we're looking for clarity on that. I don't know if I can, uh, if, if I uh, go back to both of those members. Is that clear or has that helped? Councillor Revens first. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Woolridge. Um, I'm afraid I, 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 I still can't support this amendment, um, even with the explanation. For me, this evidence needs to be scrutinised at some level and there is no opportunity to scrutinise it. So I'm my vote will, will be against this. And Councillor Redman, is, there, is that explanation clearer for you? I forgive me for being pedantic, uh, I'm sorry, certain chair. Uh, it's the last five words that may be of issue because who's to say that the supplementary information may be opposing or in negative to the agreement, including that that to me says only supporting or uh, other information evidence arising from ongoing engagement that is supporting this one business case will be put forward. If the leader of the council wants to respond to to uh, to that point regarding his proposed amendment. I'm, try I'm trying to think of a different word other than supporting, um, which you, which would help you on that one, Lee. Um, I was, I was just quick, quickly thinking of if there was a different word. I mean, the, the intention is not there only to submit some, um, positive. Um, Inform. I can say, say uh, leader, if it's helpful. Uh, I mean, you could, you know, the final, the final few words could read uh, relating to the one yeah. Somerset business case, or in connection with either of those two. That's I, a far I, more neutral I, choice I, of words. I, I would be happy to change the supporting um, this and change it to relating to the one Somerset business case. If that, if that uh, resolves the issue for for Lee Redman. That's satisfying, but it's not just me, uh, Leader. I'm, I, I'm just making my own comment. I, I, that, I know. Would, that would satisfy me. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. So we will change that wording to um, relating to the one Somerset business case. Chair, if I may, please. Councillor uh, Lewis Layton. Thank you, Chair. I would like to propose that instead of saying supporting the one Somerset business case, it says instead regarding the future of local government in Somerset. For the simple reason that none of us know what the Secretary of State is thinking yet. And if the invitation to submit has not arrived yet, that suggests it is not a straightforward case. I, I think that would take me outside of the remit of this full council vote. I think if you start allowing me to su put, submit information related into local government reorganisation in Somerset, that gives me a complete carte blanche. Uh, and, and although, as others have said it, I would, of course, never use it. I think we do need to recognise that this vote is about the one Somerset business case. And that's what this recommendation, this is what this amendment relates to. And whilst I think it's right to just change the wording uh, to support the view being represented by uh, Lee Redman, I think to, 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 to actually change those last few words I think I think is completely the wrong thing you just open it up uh, and I would uh, I'd find that difficult I think I think I think most members would find that difficult as well so I I I, I would happy to move on the uh, on the recommendation now that we've changed that single wording chair, chair can I ask my question please okay uh, I'm going to councillor Tessa Munn who's been waiting for some time councillor Munn please thank you um, I, I was going to support actually what uh, Councillor Evans has said, and that is that the this particular amendment up until the semicolon 
um, just suggests that the business case is not prepared, it's not ready, it's, it needs further backing up, it suggests it's, it's weak as it is. I have absolutely no problem with the fact that, of course, after that semicolon, one has the suggestion that the council will respond to requests from the Secretary of State. I'm slightly surprised the Secretary of State hasn't actually submitted this because we've been knowing that it's been coming next week and in three or four days or just shortly for nearly a month now. So there is some complication. So after that semicolon, I, it would be perfectly natural to respond to any um, requests that were in the invitation. Of course, I, I agree, in fact, with um, Liz Lyshon in saying that it should be about local government in Somerset because that is uh, Mr Fothergill's contention is that it should be his one Somerset business case. So that's what he's going to say, isn't he? But it is also the case that there are other points of view and he's already invited um, uh, some sort of submission from uh, and working with the districts. In fact, I think he was almost imploring the districts to actually work with him. So it may well be that actually we should have a look at this amendment in total and just say that it's perfectly in order for the leader of the council to respond to any requests that are included in the invitation from the Secretary of State um, and that anything outside of that should be put back to scrutiny, certainly scrutiny place and other scrutiny from the committees perhaps in this council. Um, so I'll leave it at that if I may. Councillor Fothergill to respond. I'm afraid I've actually made the point that I wanted to make. Uh, I think I've moved on the wording because I think that was appropriate. Um, I've responded to Liz Lation. My response is exactly the same to, to Tessa Munt. Um, I think that this um, amendment is is an appropriate amendment. It's not an unusual amendment in terms of, of, of the, the flexibility that it gives us. Uh, and I will I will move to the vote on it because I think that it's an amendment um, which does enhance the recommendations. I've got no further comment to make. Thank you. I've got uh, further questions from Andy Kendall and Simon Coles and Jane Locke. Uh, Andy, is it on the amendment or on the uh, the main uh, motion? Uh, just for you, Chair, to David. Uh, David, on um, any correspondence, will we all get de written details of what's being said either way? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Andy Kendall. Simon Coles, Councillor Simon Coles. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. My question has been asked. Um, I, th and the reason that I'm uncomfortable uh, with this is, is as, uh, as has been explained by others, um, but I'm also concerned that we will not see, before we get to vote again, any comments straight back from the, uh, from, from the Secretary of State. I would like, to, uh, I'm, I'm heartened by David's confirmation that we will see that. I'm hoping that it will go to all councillors at the same time, uh, immediately upon receipt. Thank you, Councillor Coles. Councillor Fothergill to respond, please. I, I don't. I don't think I've got any further, anything further to add. I think. Uh, I think I've made the point, and I think Simon Coles was, uh, while not agreeing with me, I think he understood, understood my position. I'll take Thank that. you, Councillor Fothergill. I now turn to Councillor Jane Locke, please. Thank you, Chair. I think the question is, David, um, how soon after receipt of the letter will other councillors be um, informed of its contents? Um, and talking of its contents, uh, you are concentrating on the one Somerset business case but uh, and a single unitary. But as I understand it, the um, Secretary of State could ask for all sorts of um, arrangements. And um, with the inclusion now, perhaps back in the mix of whether or not we look north as well, um, I'm wondering how you're going to stand if he doesn't actually ask for um, a business case for a single unitary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. Um, Chairman, if I can 
carry on. Um, so the answer to your question of how how soon, well, actually, you'll probably have it the same moment that I will, Jane, because it will be published upon the, the government website and copies will be sent to all district leaders as well. So it will be a very, um, a very transparent letter and absolutely so it should be. Um, in terms of the information, we have constantly shared our information with, uh, the, with the government as to the direction of travel on one Somerset. We have had no indication that we should stop that direction of travel and therefore we are confident that the business case which i hope will be voted through shortly uh, will be uh, will meet the, uh, the the requests of that letter i would say that if there is any mention of baines and north somerset um of course uh, the only way to be to, to 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 mix with baines and north somerset has become a unitary authority anyway so uh, so we are on the same journey. It just depends where, how far we think we're going to go. Um, Baines and North Somerset are sovereign um, councils outside of our territory. We would need to have long conversations with both of them. Uh, and of course, any business case that came that was built with Baines and North Somerset would need to come back to this full council as it would need to go back to their full councils. This debate today is purely about one Somerset, purely about the county council footprint area um, and it is about what is within our control to submit uh, everything else is just pure speculation at the moment thank you lead well we've had a proposal we've had a seconder we've had some debate and i propose that we now move this to the vote and i will ask scott to conduct the vote please thank you chair and again just for clarity for all members and all members of the public uh, this uh, is a named vote uh, for all elected members. Um, this vote is on the proposed amendment that has been submitted by the leader of the council, has been seconded, uh, and the proposed amendment, for everyone's clarity, is that council authorises the leader of the council to submit further supporting evidence arising from ongoing engagement and future consultation and any requests including in the impending invitation from the Secretary of State for Ministries of Housing, Communities and Local Government relating to this one Somerset business case. That's the proposed amendment. Uh, you'll recall that uh, members uh, proposed a named vote. That named vote will be undertaken both for this amendment and then for the full recommendations in due course. But at the moment, this is just for this amendment. Um, and I'll pause just at this point. I know Councillor Purbrick did reserve her right to speak. Uh, Councillor Purbrick, was there anything you wanted to, uh, to add before we then move to the vote? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, sorry, I, I thought you were asking me to second the, the main motion. Um, I'm obviously happy to second this one as well. Um, the point I'd like to make really is just to offer a little bit more clarity to um, or, or reassurance to members around that, that first part of the sentence. Um, within the business case um, on page um, 109 and 110, we refer to the cognizant research that has been undertaken. Members have referred to the 500 residents and obviously the 350 businesses that were contacted as part of that. That information is within our business case. However, we're also very aware of a survey that's been going on online that doesn't close um, until the end of the month. So those final that final data isn't in the business case. We also have postal responses to those surveys that are coming in thick and fast from your Somerset. Um, and I can I can give you an indication that at the moment we're looking at around 1,800 um, responses over the postal and online part of that survey um, with a 60% support um, from residents for the uh, one Somerset unit tree. So that evidence is not currently within the business case because that engagement is ongoing and obviously there will be further consultation happening um, once we move past this stage and we'd like to be able to support any evidence that comes from that. Um, also, things like the 35,000 video views that have, have happened over the last month or so and over 10,000 social yeah. media engagement. None of this is in the business case because we have not finalised those statistics. So what this amendment does is give us the opportunity to update the Secretary of State and those ministers um, as to what's going on with that ongoing engagement and later consultation. So I fully support um, the amendment and the uh, revised wording that you just read out. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you. Scott Woodrums, please. Uh, Chair, I, no I note again, I think I think before I move to the name vote, I believe that Councillor Bloomfield uh, was indicating a point of order. You'll remember at the start of the meeting, I was clear that points of order need to relate to which procedural rule or statutory provision has been broken and in what way. And at that point, I would just check with Councillor Bloomfield. Yeah, thanks, Scott. No, what it said in the note is it was in response to Faye's comment and I suggested she raise it as a point of order. I don't have one. Ah, that's fine. Then. Thank you for clarifying. In, in which point, in which case then, um, I believe we, as the Chair's already summarised, uh, we've had both proposed a second to speak. There's been debate on the amendment. I've read out the amendment to uh, all members. Uh, at this point, I will now move to a named vote. What I will ask, uh, there is a choice available to members. Uh, as I read your name, you could either type into the meeting chat, yes, no, or abstain. Or alternatively, you can switch on your microphone uh, and say either of those to the meeting. If that's clear, I shall start with Councillor Best. Councillor Bloomfield. Four. Councillor Bone. Four. Councillor Clayton. Yes, four. Councillor Caswell. Four. Councillor Chilcott. Four. Councillor Clark. Against. Councillor Coles. Against. Thank you. Councillor Dance. Against. Councillor Dimmery. Against. Councillor Filmer. Four. Councillor Fothergill. Four. Councillor Fraschini. Four. Councillor Govia. Four. Councillor Grosscock. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Councillor Ham. Four. Councillor Healy. Four. Councillor Hewitt Cooper. Four. Councillor James Hunt. Four. Councillor John Hunt. Four. Councillor Huxtable. Four. Councillor Keating. Four. Councillor Kendall. Against. Councillor Lawrence. Four. Councillor Lewis. Four. Councillor Leishon. Against. Councillor Jane Locke. Against. Councillor Tony Locke. Against. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Munt. Against. Councillor Napa. <laughs> Councillor Napa. He said four. Wherever that noise is coming from, it's not me. <laughs> Sounds like someone throwing. <laughs> Councillor Napa, I'm recording you as four, I believe. Yes. yes. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Noel. Four. Councillor Oliver. Four. Councillor Parham. Councillor Parham. Oh. He's typed in, Scott. Councillor Paul. Four. Councillor Pryor Sankey. Against. Councillor Pullin. Four. 
Councillor Purbrick. Four. Councillor Redman. Councillor Revens. Uh, I'm against, please, Mr. Aldridge. Councillor Ruddle. I'm against. Councillor Taylor. Four. Councillor Thorne. Four. Councillor Verdon. Four. Councillor BJ. Four. Councillor Wallace. Four. Councillor Weathercock. And so, where to come? I think you're on mute. You can use the chat feature. Against. Against. Councillor Josh Williams. Four. Councillor Rod Williams. Four. And finally, Councillor Woodman. Four. I'll just count up the uh, the votes. You're on mute, Scott. Again, I'll just double check those uh, those votes uh, just for the benefit of all present. That amendment is carried. It is agreed by 38 votes in favour to 14 votes against. Therefore, that amendment now joins the recommendations. Uh, and at that point, Chairman, obviously, to, it will then be for the council then to return to debate the remainder of uh, this item and obviously then to consider the recommendations now in full with the benefit of that amendment. Well, what I would highlight at this opportunity, just for the benefit of all present, uh, obviously, there's been reference to the, uh, the business case, part of the supporting evidence. Members will also be aware of other supporting evidence like the equalities impact assessment uh, that's appended uh, to these papers and also I know that you will have uh, due regards to that uh, equalities impact assessment as part of the supporting evidence. You, you will also note that uh, earlier in the, uh, the discussion there was reference made to uh, South Somerset District Council's full council meeting uh, and, and also to their resolutions as well. Members will be aware that you have had email to you a letter from the South Somerset uh, Chief Executive, uh, which sets out uh, for your information the specific recommendations that were agreed by uh, that district council. I know some of you are already aware of those, since I know you're you're also uh, district council members. But for the the wider membership, again, that's there just for additional supporting information as part <coughs> of this debate. And Chairman, uh, I believe back to yourself then to uh, oversee the debate. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to invite Councillor Fothergill to um, kick off this, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think I, my introduction stands that uh, I gave before the amendment. I'm very happy now to to introduce the the, the full item with the new amendment in the recommendations, uh, and I suggest that we move it to the debate. But um, I know that uh, Councillor Faye Purbrick, who is second in this uh, this item, may have more that she would like to add. So perhaps I can refer to her as a seconder, and she may well uh, retain the right to speak later as well. Happy to answer any questions as we go through the debate. Um, Councillor Faye Purbrick, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, happy to, to second the business case. I think I've already uh, said this uh, earlier on with the mix-up with the amendment, and I would like to reserve my right to, to speak later, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I'm going to start with Councillor Rod Williams. Just kick the debate off, please. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, my name is Councillor Rod Williams. Uh, members, uh, both officers and members are working hard. As well, as well as continuing to manage routine business, we've made a huge and very successful effort to adapt to COVID restrictions. We're managing Somerset's public health. We're restarting Somerset's economic recovery. And we're creating a climate strategy for Somerset all the time we're fighting for funding from central government. But we're doing this with one hand tied behind our back. The two tier system of districts and county is divisive, confusing and wasteful. It is a system that is not understood by most of the residents we represent. It wastes millions of pounds every year that could go on better services and it fragments Somerset's voice and it weakens it in the southwest and London. The four options in the business case can be dealt with quickly. The one thing we can't have is no change. We can't have two unitary authorities because they're too small for the population threshold the government has set. Having no structural change but working closer together is a psychological evasion and a piece of self-delusion. The simple fact is that the two tiers of districts and county are a recipe for division, tension and mistrust. We need one Somerset. We need to understand that the business case is part of a process. The business case is not a blueprint, like a drawing for a building that prescribes every detail. There are elements of one Somerset that still need to be worked out, like the responsibilities of the local community networks and the deal on offer for each parish council. But we have time to do that. We don't need to do that now. The business case is like a gateway. We have to walk through it to start down the rest of the route. What we need to do is to start. If we delay, we are forcing our residents to pay for our own hesitation, which I think is irresponsible. In closing, I support a single unitary for Somerset for three reasons. First, if we carry on working harder and harder with one hand tied behind our back with districts and county, we will drown under rising demand and falling resources. Second, of the four options in the business case, only a single unitary is viable. Third, the business case is part of a process. This means we have to walk through the gateway and not get held up by matters we can sort out later. Members, please help Somerset to the better future we can have, in which we can do more for our residents, reduce demand through joined up prevention, and make the future Somerset Council the engine of a Somerset admired by all. If you will, the single unitary is the gateway to this future. Members, will you stay working harder and harder with one hand tied behind your back? Or will you walk through this gateway with me and vote to submit the business case? Thank you, Mr Chairman. OK, um, Councillor Hazel Pryor Sankey next, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I believe in the principle of unitary uh, government uh, at local level. Um, and I, my inclination is towards one Somerset unitary. I'm a Somerset girl. I grew up here. I worked for the county council and I've been a county councillor for 27 years. And Somerset is in my blood. Um, However, I don't think that this business case is robust. Also, I'm concerned that I don't think this is the right time, given we're in the middle of a pandemic, which is definitely not going away. Um, and for the officers at Somerset Western Taunton, where I'm the chair, those staff are still trying to come to terms with and cope with the aftermath of the merger with West Somerset. And um, that was supposed to save millions of pounds, but actually 
it did the exact opposite and has cost millions of pounds to implement. So there's um, a state of flux still existing in that council. And I think it is unfair and unreasonable to expect another set of changes so soon. As for the uh, Taunton Town Council, I'm a Taunton girl, so I believe in a Taunton Town Council. Um, but I'm confused because uh, part of the proposals is that that will be introduced and I welcome that. But there seems to be no uh, indication of how you will work through all the uh, bits and pieces to do with the governance of that arrangement in time for an implementation in 2022 for a town council to be created alongside a one Somerset unitary council. Um, at the moment, we're working uh, on the uh, proposals for a town council and the implementation of that is set to be 2023. And it's not just a simple case of establishing one. It is about um, looking at the edges of the urban area where there are um, bits of the urban area that are actually in parishes and parish councils want to adjust various bits and pieces around the edges. Now that takes time. You can't just snap your fingers and make it happen. And uh, our offices at Somerset West are working towards that in 2023. So I'm not convinced that, that the, the, the way to get the town council has actually been sensibly looked at and worked out. So I'd be grateful to know where we are in all of that process under these um, unitary proposals. Um, and the third and final point that I would make is in terms of the local community network maps. Now you say there've been no questions since last week. I have been trying since we had our initial members briefing on this to be able to see the map that is in the business case for the uh, community networks um, in a detail in which I can understand what they mean. And it's simply not available. It's not on the CCG website because that was down for a while, but now it's back up, but that map is not there. And, or at least not that I can find, and officers have looked for it and can't find it there. And nobody will provide me with that information. Now, if that is real information and that's a, uh, an informed decision, that that's the starting point, and I understand that it's not necessarily the finishing point, but believe you me, these things have a habit of becoming entrenched um, and uh, set in stone. And I just can't understand why nobody can give me the information that shows me clearly where the dividing lines are between um, Taunton North, Taunton South, or South Taunton, North Taunton, and Central Taunton. I cannot find that information. I've asked, and I've asked, and I've asked, and this isn't the Democratic officer's fault. They've tried desperately to find it, and the only answer I got from Colton Brown was a message to say, the only map we have is in the business case. I know that, but I want to understand that map and know what those lines mean and where they fall in the boundaries around Taunton and I can't get that information so either somebody's just pulled that off the uh, some website somewhere and said there's 15 different areas we'll run with that or somebody's that you know done some work and, and understands what those areas mean and then surely it must be available in a format which I could be able to look at and understand where the dividing lines are but I simply cannot, cannot get that information. And it really is not for want of asking. Um, so because nobody can give me that little bit of basic information, um, even though it's not set in stone, I still want to be able to see that map in a detail in which I can understand what it means. But nobody can give it to me. And therefore, I think that this is fundamentally flawed if the simplest of little things cannot be accommodated. And therefore, I think it is not a robust business case. So an answer, please, on why I can't see the map and um, on the proposals for the uh, Taunton Town Council would be really helpful. But in general, I don't think this is a business case I can support. Um, I mean, based probably on the fact that the, uh, the budgetary issues, uh, I think there's a, a piggy bank with a whole load of IOU stuffed in it. And I've not seen anything to uh, indicate that that isn't the case. So 
Um, it's certainly not what I would describe as entirely transparent. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Before I invite Councillor David Fothergill to, re um, to reply, I'm just going to point out to councillors where you stand in the position. It'll be Councillor Locke next, then Ruddle, then Tony Locke, then Liz Leishon, Councillor Redmond, Councillor Bill Revens, Councillor Simon Coles, Councillor Andrew Govier, and Councillor David Huxtable. So, Councillor Fothergill first, please. Thank you very much. Um, Hazel, I, I'm going to start with your last point, and I think that is incredibly offensive to talk about piggy banks stuffed with IOUs. Uh, you know full well, because we have shared the financial information with you and all other councillors over the last few years, and you'll know the, uh, the, 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 the sustainable situation that this council is in, and I think that, that was a throwaway line and totally unnecessary. So I would hope that you'd reflect on that just how inappropriate it was. Um, I will come back to you on two particular points. Uh, one is the Taunton Town Council. Of course, um, the reg legislation for establishing a town council is totally different when it goes through with unitary orders uh, to what it is that uh, Somerset West may be following at the moment. Um, so the, the town council would be established at the same time as the unitary authority, and it is for the government as part of those um, uh, that, 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 that legislation to establish the size and the scope of that town council and the sitting of that town council and that will be a very big part of the transformation work oh, sorry the transition work that we have during the shadow year and of course we would want local councillors to be involved in terms of delivering the transformation costs i can't answer for somerset western taunton only you can answer why you haven't delivered the savings so you know I, i'll i'll just leave that one for you as a council and i know that you're chairman so you're probably more on top of that than i am um, but certainly we won't get down the same route uh, that Somerset West and Taunton have done. Uh, and the final one on the map, I think the map is very easily answered and I'm going to hand back to Faye uh, who's going to take that particular part of the question, but thank you. Councillor Faye Purbrick, please. Sorry, Chair, having some problems with my uh, mute button. Um, thanks very much for that. I think the that uh, Councillor Parisanki kind of answered her own question um, on the on the map. The the primary care networks were were put together by the CCG, and the map that is in the business case was produced by them purposely with with slightly blurred boundaries because obviously if somebody lives one side of a boundary but their uh, primary care uh, um, provider or GP is on the other side. Um, they're not going to be stopped from getting involved. But what that primary care network map gives us is a basis to start from. Um, if we'd put in the in the business case a map of the whole of Somerset saying, oh, we're going to slice this up 20 ways or 15 ways, that would have been particularly vague. Um, and throwing the baby out with the bathwater of um, having the starting point of the, the PCNs, the, the primary care networks within the business case makes sense. If those borders were drawn hard and it was really clear exactly what street every single one of those ended on, then at this point in the procedure, that would be entrenched. It would be set in stone. Um, those were the councillor's own words. That is not the point of the business case. The business case is to lay out the direction of travel um, within the implementation process. Um, we will look to work with all of those communities, parish councils, town councils, district councils, and anybody else who wants to get involved to see where those lines should be drawn to best represent our communities across Somerset. Thank you, Councillor Perbrick. Um, Right, since I, I, I outlined the number of speakers still to speak, we've had Adam Dance and Martin Dimery. I just wanted to let those two councillors know we have logged you, but you actually came up after I'd uh, written down this and uh, gone online. So we're now going to go to Councillor Tony Locke, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got a question on, um, on planning uh, for the Chairman. And... Uh, with uh, over half a million people living in Somerset and approximately half of those over 65, uh, one national park, which we're all proud of, and many areas of outstanding natural beauty, 
planning being delivered by one authority and with government making more of the decisions and changes to planning on a regular place on a regular basis how do you think these issues would um, affect our local communities will this be beneficial to our communities and local areas as well as all of our environmental and green strategies which we have and which we are adopting to make what is our county an even safer, healthier and green environmentally friendly place. And uh, one last final point, point, I feel I must raise this here. I've always advocated this from day one and, uh, and I realise it will be the minister who will make the decision on how we proceed and what he's suggesting and what we have. But I still feel that it should something this important. It should be all of the people who Somerset of Somerset who makes the decision, whether it be a referendum or what have you. But it is something which affects them. And I believe they should be the ones deciding it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, David Fothergill to reply. I will. I think there was two two items there, uh, Chairman. Um, I'm sure Councillor Locke has med, read the business case in full. If he has done, then he'll know the answers to his questions on planning are detailed in section 7.2.2, page 83, uh, and it gives full details about how planning will be carried out, uh, recognising the current area boards in South Somerset, and also increasing the number of planning area boards uh, in, in other areas potentially. So, so I refer you back to the business case, uh, Tony, you might have missed that page. Uh, in terms of uh, the referendum, the, I've, I've said straight at the beginning that the next stages in the consultation will be determined by the Secretary of State, whether it's uh, for our business case or for a, some other business case that may come forward. And we will we will abide by the Secretary of State's requirements, uh, and that is the right thing to do. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. Uh, Councillor Dean Ruddle. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me OK? Um, I would like to talk about contingencies. I see uh, we've only got in our on page uh, 168 or 94 table 20. Um, we've only got a contingency in place for implementation of Somerset 1. However, I see there is no implementation of going forward uh, for when we're talking about we have a, a net revenue budget uh, altogether of 40 million. I see not having a contingency is a huge risk, especially without having the full information from the districts, because I believe we haven't got all the information from the districts at the moment. Uh, what happens if extra funding is needed? Where will this come from as this is not shown in our business plan? Can you answer that, David, please? Thank you. Councillor Faye Perbrick to reply. I, I'm happy to take that question, Faye, unless you particularly wanted to take that question. No, happy yes. day. Carry on. Okay, uh, the fund, uh, the uh, the funding set out in the business case, I think, Dean, is entirely uh, and transparent. It shows uh, what the additional costs will be, and it shows what the additional savings will be moved by moving to a, a single uh, council. And I think that uh, it's very clear that the costs of that transition uh, will fall with the county council during the transition year. We've always said that. We recognise that. Uh, and indeed, in terms of contingencies, we now have over seventy-six million pound of reserves if required, but I absolutely fundamentally believe this business case is, is fully costed, fully funded uh, 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 and totally achievable. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. Councillor Liz Leishon. Thank you very much, Chair. I was just writing that down. Fully costed, fully funded, totally achievable. Is that correct? Um, I beg to differ, Chair. My concerns are entirely about the uh, robustness of the business case uh, and the fact that it doesn't follow the Treasury's Green Book supplementary guidance. In fact, Chair, it doesn't even follow the guidance I had to take from the Arts Council when I put a business case together for a million pound project. So I was always taught that you had to prove the need. And sure enough, this business case, I believe, does do that. And it is a very comprehensive audit of where Somerset is now. Then it has to 
uh, prove the project's deliverable within the budget that's been set, including contingency. And I also have my concerns on that and a time scale, and that's under the implementation costs. And then in my day and in my job, I had to prove that the resulting organisation post project was feasible in terms of both operation and financial viability. And I know we have the transition savings in the table, but every time we've been asking questions at briefing, at scrutiny, at cabinet, we have been told time and time again, that is for the new council to decide. So the new council, how is the new council going to know what it's got until after this has gone through? Mergers and acquisitions, people put in huge contingencies to cope with what they can't find out because they know more will unravel after the merger. Uh, and, and the financial picture of the county council itself is not always complete. We're coming to a treasury management outturn report that does not mention the internal borrowing at all. You can track back to the February meetings and previous meetings and you can work out that that is the case. But I want to know how the residents of Somerset can be expected to understand the implications for them and the levels of council tax should the Secretary of State welcome this business case. I personally regret that this did not happen in 2007 when, just to annoy Councillor Bloomfield, I did support it. And so I'll annoy him a bit more by saying that I can still support it in theory, but in practice, I do not believe this business case is robust. How are council taxpayers supposed to understand what lies ahead of them? Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Chair. Did you want me to respond? Um, well, I'll try to decipher that ramble. Um, first of all, I will say that this um, this business case fully complies with the Treasury Green Book. We've explained that in a number of occasions, and it meets the uh, the five requirements of the Treasury Green Book. And we'll uh, we'll 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 receive a full tick from the Treasury in terms of how it's been submitted. So when you've done your lottery application, I'm not sure what more you need to do, Liz, but uh, we certainly comply. Um, in terms of any sensitivity analysis, um, then. The they are contained with the appendix if in appendix e uh, page 127 of the of the uh, of the business case and they are green book compliant i would also add of course that we do have a 10% contingency amount built or into that already um, <coughs> excuse me and in and in terms of the implications for the residents in terms of the council tax, I'm going to hand to Faye Perbrick to uh, to do that. Uh, but I do think it's muddy in the waters by talking about uh, internal borrowing, which of course is just still county council money, which has been moved around between accounts. I think you're muddy in the water slightly there and a bit disingenuously. So, but let me hand over to Faye so she can tell uh, the residents how uh, the council tax would be impacted. Thanks, David, and thanks for your question, Liz. I think the, the key thing for me um, that you asked is, is how can residents know what the implications are for them? Um, I think the, the implications of, of one Somerset are that they've got one place that they need to go to to ask for support, that everything is clear, that the accountability sits with that one Somerset Council, um, and that they can expect to see strong services, great communication, uh, and all the fantastic work that is done by all the councils we have at the moment, carrying on, but in a much easier and more strategic way. Um, the the question around council tax i draw your attention to page 168 of the council um, papers page 94 of the business case which talks about council tax harmonization um, as i mentioned during one of the member briefings recently the council tax difference between um, the councils across somerset is is very small um, and so council tax harmonization will be probably the smallest thing on this agenda it's not like some other recent unitaries where those gaps have been massively wide and we're looking at a difference at the highest level for a bandy property in somerset western taunton it's 165 pounds and 15 pence whereas uh, in south somerset it's an additional uh, 4.2 percent at 170 72 pounds and 11 pence so all within the boundaries of, of quite simple harmonization and all very clear for our residents to see what it will mean to them in that respect 
Thank you. Councillors, before we move on down the list, it's only right. Uh, Councillor Neil Bloomfield got mentioned by name by Councillor Liz Leishon. And I must give Neil Bloomfield the right of reply. Councillor Bloomfield, do you wish to say anything? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I only picked up obviously on my name. I, enormous respect for Liz and, and the work she does. And, and she's an extremely able councillor without any doubt at all. I mean, but some of the points raised, I mean, you know, pick up on internal borrowing. I'm, I'm the chair of one of the largest parishes in Somerset and we have earmarked reserves. We have general reserve account. We move money around. That's 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 nothing sinister involved in that. That's just how councils, well, that's how good councils should operate, I believe, making good use of its resources. But I think the main thrust of what uh, Liz was saying was, um, you know, being in favour of unitary but voting against it. You know, it's been said from the outset that this this is the starting pistol, if you like. This is this is like choosing to move house. You don't go and buy a house and expect everything you want, but you've made the decision in principle and you're going to go ahead and do it. And I see no issue here with firing the starting pistol on Unitary, but then to vote against this plan. Um, I just find it, you know, I do find it rather disingenuous, I have to say. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Lee Redman, please. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, for the record, my group has not made up their mind fully in this debate. We've agreed to listen today and decide independently once we have heard the discussion. The unity debate was a new one for me. Over the past few months, I've been engaging in and listening to as much of the debate as I can. It will be no secret to most of you that I think Bridge Somerset is too big. Too often we don't listen to the people in our communities and at times is its own worst enemy by taking decisions without considering those we serve. We are heading towards a possible submission of this business case. The detail contained in the business case and the presentations have all been relatively clear. The problem to me is the what if. The potential outcome is full of them. You don't have to answer these, David, but what if the Secretary of State makes changes to the business case? What if the Secretary of State does not agree with the proposal? Then what if others submit a different business case? As a twin hatter, can I support both business cases? What if councillors like me, those willing to engage, are not listened to? And none of these appear to be answered but my big concern is that I have only one business case to decide upon now, and it appears that the Secretary of State will make the final decisions for me. On a positive note, I have to be honest, the fact that the current business case says wherever possible, decisions will be taken at the local level is music to my ears. The local community networks sound perfect. This business case offers the potential for one Somerset a council to make the big decisions, and then the local network to help guide the implementation. Local people having the sh having lo local people helping to shake their communities. I'm pleased, like me, you support the Sulk recommendation. But again, what if the community networks are dismissed? What if the boundaries are set against local people? Even if the Secretary of State supports the business case. Who's to say we will end, we will get it all in the end? We need a council that is big enough to matter and small enough to care. My three questions to the leader are, what happens if the districts wake up and want to get involved? Is the door still open? Because as a twin hatter, the last thing I want was to have to vote for two business cases. What guarantee do councillors have that if a decision is taken by the Secretary of State to support a business case, how can we be sure we get the outcome expected? A final question is how can I be assured that if a decision is taken to go one Somerset, backbenchers like me are not left outside the room having things shaped around us? My final comment for council is, can we please seek guarantees in the paper to ensure every councillor is involved in the formation of a new council if the decision goes that way. Thank you, Chair. 
So, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor David Fothergill. Thank you. So, Lee, I'm I'm going to be absolutely straight with you, as I always am. The, the vote today is on the one Somerset business case. That one Somerset business case has been built primarily by the by the county council um, because despite offers to involve other councils, they have chosen not to. So so the so we need to be clear that we are voting on this business case. And and your question about what happens if the districts want to get involved? Well. The reason they'll want to get involved is because I think they're realising that actually change is coming uh, and therefore they will want to be involved. And I think that any debate about them building their own business case should be absolutely welcomed. Uh, and I do welcome that and I would want to get involved with them. Um, and the only reason that we're at this stage is because this one Somerset business case is being brought forward and they are being encouraged to respond to it. So I think that's fantastic. I'm Disappointed that they've not been involved in building this case. Um, I would love them to have been. I've put out many offers and, and I would love to be involved with them in building their alternative business case because maybe it will be better. I don't know. Um, but until I see the shape of it and the size of it, I just don't know. But the, the, we need to be very clear that this is about um, submitting a business case which we believe is entirely uh, in the interests of people in Somerset. And that is what uh, we should vote for. So, But I, I make the absolute commitment to, to get involved with the districts. If they start to build their business case, I know South Somerset are involved. I know that they've been talking to the CCG and they've been talking to Devon County Council for some obscure reason. Um, but um, I, uh, I will, I will commit to work with them because I do think it's about getting it right for Somerset. But this today is about our business case, which we believe is right for Somerset people. Uh, what if, what guarantee is there? Um, the Secretary of State will take our business case and he will form legislation around it. And during the the, 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 the formation of that legislation, things may change. So, so I can't answer all your what ifs. Uh, there's a lot of what ifs in life and I can't answer them all. But what I can do is I can lay out a, a route map and I can lay out a preference and then we, it's for us to argue. And that's why I need your help. That's why I need every councillor's help in, in this call to say, we need to work together from this point when we submit this business case we now need to come together and we need to work together as one and we need to be start forming those task and finish groups we need to start forming those those small subcommittees of how we actually cement in we bake in all the promises that we, we, we're making um, and that's what we will request of the, of the secretary today. if we're speaking with one voice then we will get what we want and that's why it's really important that we work together and that's why i made my offer to you and the other opposition leaders and all members um, in my opening speech that we need to move to the next phase and begin to determine what this one unit one unitary somerset would look like in addition to keep talking to the district councils and anybody else that puts in a business case. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. Now, the next speaker will be Bill Revens, but just so you all know where you are in the queue, it'll be then Councillors Coles, Govier, uh, Adam Dance, Martin Dimry, Loveridge, Hunt, Councillor Tessa Munt, Mike Best, Christine Lawrence and Jane Locke. So, Bill Revens, please. Councillor Bill Revens. Good afternoon and thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, throughout this debate on Unitary, I, I, the principle I've had in mind is a council that's big enough to cope and small enough to care. Uh, I sit as a twin hatter or triple hatter as some technical Pelleton Town Councillor as well, and I sit on the Central District Council. Um, I, I have heard with some jealousy that, that, David, you've been to speak to other district councils, and I'm sure you'd be it would be very interesting to hear you speak at Sagemore as well. And I look forward to that occasion. I think historically Somerset's had this difficulty of geography. Um, if we go back historically, before 1974, we had rural district councils and uh, running the council, and, uh, and before the um, 19th century reforms, we had. The hundreds moots, which are uh, an ancestor of uh, Anglo-Saxon governments resolving local issues. And it's how these, what we're the, the latest incarnation of them, the local community networks or area boards, how they're drawn up together um, is, is what interests me because thereby hangs the localism and the responsibilities that they have. In the documents, 
it's very vague on these responsibilities and the areas that they cover. And my concern is that this prospectus for one Somerset is, is not making any promises. It is just looking at a, a, a vague commitment. I look at the, I've spoken to councillors in Wiltshire and Dorset and Cornwall and Shropshire uh, during this process, and the, the localism elements of it differ greatly. Um, I've looked at the lists of what Wiltshire um, give to their local boards. And I, I, I find it quite quite anodyne and 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 really, really barely worth having. Um, I understand Dorset, they haven't even brought them in yet. Um, and this is what concerns me. Who who will be putting this forward? What's what does lie ahead for us? Um, I think the residents need, of some set need a lot more firmer proposals on these uh, local local networks that um, in the communities. Is it not fairer to suggest that um, the, the business case isn't really going to be discounted councils, but perhaps it will be for the shadow executive to put forwards? And the difficulty is how, do, how does that get influenced? Are we setting ourselves off on a single track that we can't U -turn, make a U-turn from? I think this this situation we should have been much more deliberative, much more collaborative with our district partners, and I, I'm afraid I think we've got ourselves into into a into a journey with, with only one destination, and I think we have set the destination before we thought about um, the other the other ideas that, that that could have come forward as well. I notice that there are some interesting proposals coming up from the districts. I noticed that there are some interesting suggestions from some of our members of parliament. And I wonder whether it would be better to hit the pause button, listen to what other people try to do. And as the actual motion su suggests, let's try and find a consensus, but not necessarily a consensus around one outcome. Let's think broadly and try and bring us all together on this subject. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reddams. Councillor Fogel. I'm not sure what well, I, I think that's Bill's view and he's entitled to his view and we're all entitled to a view. Um, I'm very clear um, that we have built in, uh, in uh, local community networks into our business case that if it's voted through shortly, um, it will become part of this county council policy. Uh, and it is what this county council will argue for. We will go to the secretary of state and this is what we, we require in the legislation, um, it, provided he chooses our business case. I mean, at the end of the day, we're not actually voting. Can I just remind everybody, we're not voting here to have a unitary authority. We are voting to submit a business case. Um, so we just have to, I think Neil Bloomfield has got it absolutely bang on. Um, and, and we all know that I've not always agreed with Neil, but he's got it bang on this time, which is this is about open that door and having those further conversations we are given a clear route map through we are given a clear uh, direction but it, it we have to we have to take this journey everybody agrees that the challenges facing Somerset are such that we cannot do nothing and I'm afraid Bill I have been talking this conversation for the last two and a half to three years and, and I still don't get people coming to my meetings um, wanting to talk about it that's how much they rate um, how important services in public services in Somerset are they don't even come to the meetings that's why we are where we are and that's why we need to take this decision and that's why we need to get people focused on how we better deliver public services in Somerset. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. Councillor Neil, you've been, Neil Bloomfield, you've been named again, uh, so I must give you the right of reply. Um, should you like to come back in? Yeah, I, I, I hardly know what to say to that. Many of you won't know that David Fothergill is also the uh, president of my fan club, so I have nothing further to say. Thank you. <laughs> it's pleasant to see humour is still reigning. Councillor Simon Coles, you're the next speaker. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a couple of uh, a couple of concerns here about the business case um, as as currently being presented. Um, one one is around timing, and the other is around um, the 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 costings used um, on page one six eight, table twenty. I'm referring to. Um, 
you describe a one-off value of £8.4 million for redundancies and pension strains for staff reduction. Um, if you look at what happened in Dorset, for example, uh, you will see that Dorset had uh, originally at this stage considered that there would be 200 redundancies um, and they hoped that they would all fall in the right place. Um, they ended up with 300 redundancies. Now, that's a 50% increase in their redundancy costs. I don't see that we have currently got in this business case uh, a sufficient uh, reserves a sufficient contingency, um, which is one of the reasons why I can't uh, I can't support it. I also can't support it because um, if we look at the economic uh, I I impact of COVID-19, um, as they become all the costs become revealed as furlough ends, with inevitable redundancies, shouldn't this council put back the intent to ask the Secretary of State for an invitation to submit the business case? for the future of local government in Somerset, or Fogus, if you prefer. Um, should we not re hold that back at this stage um, and aim to retain and protect as many of the permanent posts in Somerset as possible and return to the one Somerset case when the economy is returned to some sort of stability? Um, there is a time for change and there is a, and, and there is a time to sit tight. And I genuinely believe that right now, this is the time to sit tight. This is not the time uh, to, to make wholesale change without sufficient uh, su sufficient wherewithal and sufficient contingency plans. I don't think the contingency plans and the financing of this are even remotely close to reality, having seen uh, amalgamations before and having seen what happens when you don't get all the redundancies that you might have wished for, you end up with a very, very mixed bag. And as I said, in Dorset's case, it was uh, a 50% increase. And that, frankly, would be unaffordable in your business case, David. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, councillors that are already on the list. Um, please, uh, will you drop your hands unless you do wish to speak again in due course? I've got Councillor Neil Bloomfield indicating his hands up and Councillor uh, Adam Dance um, with his hand up. So if you don't wish to speak again, could you be kind enough to drop your hands, please? The next speaker is Andrew I'm Sorry, I, so Chairman, I think I need to respond. Sorry. Uh, I, I, I think I need to. Thank you. Sorry, I, I just want to pick up, want to pick up because I, I'm sure that uh, Simon didn't mean it this way, but you cannot use phrases like if you don't get as many redundancies as you wish for. I don't wish for any redundancies and the, we will be working very hard in the implementation of this business case to ensure that any redundancies um, will be minimised but through natural turnover and people that are choosing uh, uh, of their own volition to leave. What we won't be doing though is follow, following the, the model that Somerset West and Taunton have followed which was a complete um, dog's breakfast, if I can use that phrase. That's probably the best phrase I can use. and uh, I'm sure it get quoted in the press. It was a dog's breakfast. And, and unfortunately, I'm sorry to say that Dorset followed the same model. We need to learn and we will learn because that is not the route that we will go down. The 8.4 million is well costed. It is the maximum amount. Uh, we know exactly uh, 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 of how that's constructed uh, and it will be minimis, minimised through redeployment uh, 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 and the natural wastage. So uh, you should rest assured, Simon, that uh, we will have a full handle on this situation. And I still believe that uh, now is the time. We have to deliver this change for people in Somerset. These challenges that I talk about in terms of social care, adults, children's housing, uh, in terms of planning, climate change. They existed pre-March the 23rd and they exist today and they will continue to exist. We have a responsibility as civic leaders of this county to look ahead and do something about it. And the time to do about something about it is now we have a business case before us and I would urge you again to think about what you're saying and that you take the brave decision and support it. May I come back very quickly, Chair? Uh, yes, you may. Just a single comment. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, there, in this business case, I cannot find any budget for retraining. 
Um, now, you, you mentioned, David, that you would look to minimise redundancies, and I'm very, very pleased to hear that. But nowhere in there is there sufficient money that I can see to cover, for example, retraining of staff. So, uh, you know, I remain, I'm afraid, unconvinced by your business uh, plan as it is at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Fothergill. Uh, I, I think Simon's looking for reasons not to support this. Uh, the, uh, clearly, no matter what I say, he's not going to support this. The, he, he's in a particular position. I've asked him to brave and make the right decision. Uh, he's come back and clearly we're not going any further. So let's move to the next question. Thank you. Councillor Adam Dance, please. Councillor Adam Dance. Uh, thank please. you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman. Sorry, my... Uh where I am, the broadband isn't great, so you'll have to bear with me. So I won't put my camera on because it might make it worse. Um, my question is, this council has internal borrowing of 31.7 million in the last financial year. Although the figure is not available or necessarily necessary in the Treasury Management Report and may have internal borrowing in excess of 85 million by the end of this financial year, the leader denied that there had been any borrowing for any of any description at the briefing of South Somerset District Council on Monday the 13th of July. So my question is, which answer is actually correct? Thank you. Mandy. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, this will actually be covered um, in the next paper, the annual Treasury Management Outturn, but I can confirm that this council, the debt has reset, remained the same at the end of March 19 as it is at March 20, and I'll pick it up in the next report, if I may. Thank right, you. Okay, Councillor uh, Martin Dimery. David Fothergill did say there had been no borrowing of any description at South Somerset. That's correct. I, 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 I think what I meant, if I, my words were wrong, is that we have had no additional debt um, in the last 10 years. In fact, since the Liberal Democrat Party left administration, we've incurred no further uh, debt um, and we're still paying off the 360, which your party managed to run up in the, in the, in the 10 years before. <laughs> Councillor Martin Dimery. Thank you. Um, I'd say in answer to some of the points made before, I think it's perfectly legitimate um, to uh, to be in favour of a single unitary authority, but not necessarily this model. I don't think it's disingenuous at all. And, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm disappointed that districts have not engaged in this debate constructively, given that we're expecting the government white paper and um, a nation nationwide review on it. Um, uh, that would bring into consideration the, the, the smaller unitaries on our borders of Baines and North Somerset. And, and this might open up other options and create uh, more compact and, and, and viable single unitary authorities, maybe east and west, perhaps north and south, and with more manageable networks of transport, education and health. Um, in, in my view, Somerset is, and I've always believed, it's simply too big geographically to operate all services evenly, fairly and effectively, and, and to the limited powers, and they are limited by the looks of things, of community networks and planning boards, won't necessarily compensate for that, uh, given that, especially given that unitary councillors will be the only ones that have the right to vote on those committees. You know, what works for Bristol, what works for Swindon, does not necessarily work in large um, areas uh, of, of countryside. Um, and if we've used Wiltshire a lot uh, as an example here, Wiltshire is now suffering enormous financial problems. So there are no guarantees that this will, will work financially. Um, in North East Somerset, we rely heavily on Baines for much of our education, uh, health provision, employment. So I think it's in the interest of the people I represent to have uh, more options at their disposal. And despite what has happened with the District Council, I, I think we should be um, would it not be fairer for us to, to, to hold back and um, wait until the government white paper is published and give the people of this county some real choices?
I'd like to start off by reassuring the residents, particularly around um, the edges of the county, who receive extremely personal services from us, those that receive adult social care services and uh, our elderly population that receive services and our children that are in care services, that I will absolutely stand up till the very last day for the services that we provide them. I will not let them be disrupted um, by the county being divided in half. And we should re seek to reassure people that we will not undermine our services by looking to split services in half which would fundamentally um, affect uh, the way that those services are delivered. So let me start out by reassuring everybody that is receiving services today that this process will not affect services and any move to split social care, children's services and a host of other vulnerable services would have an impact upon our, our most vulnerable residents and I will not let that happen uh, while I've got uh, I've got the leader badge on my chest. Um, I would say that the, the Baines and the North Somerset conversation is an ongoing conversation. Of course, it's an ongoing conversation. I've said already, but that, that we have a letter on file from them both that said that they do not want to be involved in the internal discussions of local government reorganisation in Somerset. If, if the Secretary of State determines that we should have that conversation, then I will be ringing them up on the very first afternoon to book a meeting and invite them down to County Hall to come and talk about it. And I'll be showing them the I'll be showing them the stained glass windows that we've still got here that talk about Western Supermare and Radstock and all those places that disappeared in 1974. Because actually, I'm I, I have a keen interest in history. Ultimately, though, they will have to determine whether they wish to lose any sovereignty, and that will not be for me to decide. So let's focus on the job in hand. The job is, do we want to support this business case to be, to, to be sent to the Secretary of State? And all I'm hearing is reasons to delay. The reason not to delay is it will have a serious impact upon the way the services are delivered across county, across district in years to come if we do not make this move now. And I would almost start to move towards the vote because I think we're going round in circular arguments about how we delay and we cannot afford to delay. We need to move the vote very soon. Councillor Govia, sorry to have kept you. Um, you. You were on my list, but I'm afraid yeah. that uh, there was a little no. bit of a muddle there. So, Councillor Govia, thank you for your no, patience. No, no problem at all, Chair. And um, uh, following on from what the leaders just said, I mean, I think that this is a very important, and I think he alluded to at the beginning, a, a key decision that, and probably one of the most important decisions uh, we as county councillors will have to make. And, and I, I think it is appropriate there's been a level of scrutiny. But during the well over an hour, probably close to two hours now, we've been discussing this, I've heard no real uh, objection to the idea of a unitary authority. What I've heard is, as, as the leaders just perhaps said, you know, some ideas where it could be, um, you know, we could delay it, we could push it down the road. And and I, I, I just don't see that the, any point in that. I, th I think now is the time to make a decision. The three issues that come are being brought to my attention are, are one, that this is a takeover by Somerset County Council. And local residents have seen over the, you know, last 10, 11 years or so, the number of cuts that have been made and, and, and they're, they're reluctant to, to, to go down the road of being taken over by the county council. That's what they say to me. But but this is very clear. This isn't a takeover. This is actually the construction of a new authority based on um, the dissolution of Somerset County Council and the four remaining districts. The other thing that people say to me is it's a shame that um, we've just gone through the um, uh, reorganisation at Somerset West and Taunton. Yes, again, that is regrettable. It's been handled. Um, I think David referred to it as a dog's breakfast. There's, there's, there's lots of stronger terms you could use for it, but it has been a complete and to shambles and to be frank um, it, it really was regrettable at the time when some of us were saying we needed to look at wider reorganisation within Somerset not just this narrow um, reorganisation which took place between those two authorities and the, set, the third point that people are keen, keep raising up today and in, in the public is it's the wrong time yes it is the wrong time in my opinion um, and I would support going right back to the beginning the comments made by Chris Mann in, in, the, in his public question the right time to make this decision was when it came up to, in 2000 if we'd done that, we could have offset many of the um, cuts to public services that have been pushed through in the last few years. So the right time was 2007, but we can't go back. So we need to look forward. And I would like to say um, I support the comments made by Councillor Rod Williams right at the beginning that this is an opportunity 
now to grasp a future for Somerset which will improve um, local services through uh, better delivery through parish councils, town councils. I know our town council in Wellington is very ambitious. We want to take on more services. I don't think enough's been made of that. I think we're talking about taking everything into the centre. I see this as an opportunity for the devolution of services to uh, town and parish and, and city councils. So I, I really see that as an exciting opportunity. I think there will be significant financial savings. I'm, I'm as other councils are, triple hatters. And the number of people who contact me and all they really blame is the council. The council this, the council's done that, the council should do this. If we had uh, a town and a uh, county council, it would be much clearer who responsibility lies. And I, I honestly believe there would be huge improvements in operational, uh, the way we work operationally, because we would be able to integrate things like housing uh, and environment and that sort of thing into all the other things to do with social care and uh, in children's and adults to make things a much more rounded service. So uh, I fully support this business plan. I'm, I'm, there are issues in it I've got, but but I think to, t to just pick those out as a way of delaying is, is not right. I think if you support Unitary in Somerset, you should support this business plan as a way of opening the door and starting the conversation towards a better run of organisation of local government in Somerset. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Govia. Councillor Fothergill. Hold on, Chair. Sorry, Chair. I was just, uh, I was just distracted there for a moment, but I, I, I mean, I've talked to Andrew over the years um, about Unitary. Um, he's always been a great supporter. I, I'm pleased that he's still a supporter. Uh, he and I know that there are things that we need to debate uh, as we go forward. I look forward to involving him fully in that debate. Uh, and I think he's got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, expertise and a lot of knowledge to bring to that debate. And I, and I welcome his comments. Thank you. Now, councillors, the time is going on and I don't want somebody to uh, push uh, move for a vote just yet, but I do want you to sharpen up what you want to say. Please raise new points. We are going over or starting to go over a little bit of the old ground. So I will expect each one of you now to concentrate on new points as I ask you to speak. Councillor David Loveridge, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I've nothing new. All I want to do, most of what I want to say has been said. Um, in 2007, I voted against Unitary. Maybe that was a mistake. But I now firmly believe that the, the, or the, the district councils have had their day. And I, I'm, I'm quite happy to support a Unitary bid. Not happy with the plan completely, but it's the only one we've got, Chairman, and I'm happy to support it. Thank you, Councillor Loveridge. Thank you for being succinct. Councillor John Hunt, the same applies, please. Councillor John Hunt. Thank you, Chair, sorry, having a bit of a problem with the minute, minute button there. Um, I think most of us agree that our current local government model is obsolete and that change is needed. Um, it is my opinion that a unitary authority is going to happen with or without us. And as councillors, it's our responsibility to those we represent to take as much control over its establishment as possible. My main concern with this proposal was that it would distance the, the unitary authority from those it represents at grassroots level. Um, having asked many, many questions on this subject, I am now happy that the establishment of local community networks will bring the proposed council to the people. Therefore, I am supporting this one Somerset proposal today. I am also an elected member of the Somerset West and Taunton District Council and I do look forward to hearing the proposed or their promised unitary proposal from the ruling party there. Um, subject to the content, content of that proposal put forward by them, I may well also support that because I think it's very important that the Secretary of State receives more than this single unitary proposal so that he, he at least will have an alternate view enabling him to make a more informed decision that will hopefully be in the interest of those that we serve. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. Councillor Tessa Munt. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, David, for allowing me to ask questions. Um, 
I wondered why the business case, um, and it's particularly the graphic on page 81 or page 7, depending on which version you're looking at, um, hasn't taken note of the low council tax base um, in the Somerset area. Um, I know the leaders referred in the past to the, the loss of higher council tax banding of houses in the Baines area um, when residents from that area left Somerset. And I've always, I've often raised the loss of more than £24 million a year to Somerset County Council through several years of frozen council tax. And we've all seen the figures. But the facts are that these years left Somerset with the very lowest income out of all the county councils in England. And those will, those changes will have severely hampered Somerset's efforts to run children's services and have contributed to the need to have all those cuts in September 2018, um, and which are still running into this year. I wonder whether the business case might have taken that more into account and addressed those losses caused by historic decisions. Um, and I also wanted to ask about what happens when people are unable to pay their council tax whether that's for reasons of having lost their jobs or their businesses through the COVID period, um, a situation that will inevitably have a much greater impact on those who are low paid and less privileged. I know that there is a significant number of people who don't have um, to worry so much because their council tax may be taken care of by other taxpayers by, by some sort of benefit, but I'm concerned about that. I have a second question, but I'd like to ask that after after that, if I may, please. Councillor Fothergill, please. Um, I, I know that Tessa and I have had long conversations about the tax base of uh, of Somerset and and the fact that we are a very low tax base and for everybody listening in that means that for every one percent we increase council tax we get a revenue of about two million in Hampshire it's about seven million and in Surrey it's at about 11 million so so one percent in Somerset is very different to one percent in 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 in, in, um, in Surrey uh, and I think we accept that. I th I don't think there was any need to put that into our business case because I think actually that will be uh, the same. Even even you know if we if we form the one Somerset um, uh, plan, it will be exactly the same. Uh, so therefore, I don't think it was it was necessary to put it into the business case. And and of course, the transition savings um, do illustrate that there is a considerable saving to move in this direction anyway. Uh, in terms of um, people who can't afford to pay their council tax, I think it's a really big issue for us that uh, that will develop but not as big an issue as for, for individuals which are going to be affected um I'm not sure where this will go or how far this will go. Um, currently, we're, we're projecting that three to five percent of, of council tax may be affected in this way. It will affect the districts, of course, in exactly the same way. Um, and I think there's a lot to play out. Um, but we we have to recognise that that is going to be a challenge for us and for districts until we form a unitary. Um, so so it's, it's something we need to be very mindful of and see how we can help people through a very difficult period. Thank you, Councillor Munt, for your second and final question. Yeah, I do have a second question, yes, and um, it, it relates to children's services. And David, I don't know whether it's a question for you or whether it's a question for Francis, I'm not sure. Um, but it, it's possibly a question for you. In a meeting in the last week, and I can't, I genuinely cannot remember which one it was, um, I know that Frances Nicholson, the councillor in charge of children's services, sought the support of her colleagues in ensuring funding was allocated to that department regardless of what happens with local government reorganization can i ask what that means in financial terms please uh, um, i wasn't in that meeting so i'm going to have to hand to francis who was in the meeting and knows what she said by that i don't know if she's uh um, she's I, I'm, I, I'm here and i don't think i know what uh, uh, I, I don't think i understand entirely what tess is talking about um you were quite clear um, in saying that there should be support for children's services and that um, whatever happened, um, there should be the ability to fund children's services for what changes need to take place in order to... It was to do with the SEND report, that's what it was, um, I remember now. So it must have been scrutiny related to SEND and I'm quite clear about the fact that you asked your colleagues, and I, I don't mean your Conservative colleagues, I think you were seeking the support of the council generally, 
um, to make sure that. Uh, yeah, I'm, cl I'm clear what we're talking about. No, I, I don't think I'm asking for support from my colleagues in any shape or form. I'm merely stating the fact that children need to be supported, whatever arrangements of councils there are. And I would um, just for the record uh, say that uh, this council has put huge amounts of additional funding in. Um, we put in capital for building more special school places so that children can be educated locally close to their own homes. Um, we are addressing um, the uh, backlog in uh, rapidly dealing with uh, education, health and care plans within the, their appropriate time limits so that month on month the proportions are going up. We have uh, we have staff and made permanent staff to address that. Um, the spend um, from the high needs block on uh, support of children with SEND um, has gone up well above what was originally budgeted for. Uh, I'm, merely state, I'm merely stating a fact that uh, children both need to be supported and will be supported so long as I have breath in my body and have anything to do with it, um, and whether that is this council or any other council. Uh, thank you, but I, I, I sense I don't wish to pursue this hugely, but I do sense that after you know, I've heard that same message since I was elected and long before it, um, and that I was asking really what that meant in financial terms, because clearly there's been six years of problems, um, if not longer, and therefore there must be a sum that you were seeking for to, to make sure that this stuff is developed and actually the services to children are delivered. I have the support that I need for my colleagues. Of course, um, I am clear that there have been problems um, we, uh, with uh, special educational needs and disabilities. We all know the major improvements in children's social care that have gone on over the last five years, and as, as you are, are well aware. And I am confident in the support of uh, my colleagues um, for uh, the, the support of children. And I am confident uh, that the changes that need to be made are being made. And, and can I just add to that, because I do think it needs to go on record. Um, I've always said that the children in this county are my number one priority. The, the vulnerable children that are in our care, the 520 tonight, uh, are, are our number one priority. Uh, they are actually the future of this county. Um, they are um, so important to us. They will always be my number one priority. They'll always be my, my administration's number one priority. And for any administration that I serve in in the future, either as leader, as as a cabinet member or as a backbencher, I would certainly seek to make sure that children are always the number one priority um, because they have a future in front of us and we need to make sure that they've got the very best opportunities in life. Thank you, uh, councillors. Uh, I now want to steer the debate back to what we should be talking about. And I'm going to contact Mike Best, please. And Mike, will you only raise original um, issues, please? Mike Best. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, hopefully I will be brief. Uh, what evidence is there that districts are struggling as identified in the report? I think it was on page 86. Is it not the case that the County Council received quite a lot more government funding than districts? And obviously the outlay and the work that the districts have, have done during the COVID have influenced the uh, financial situation. Is it basically purely on that or other uh, issues that have been used as evidence? I, I'm very happy to this, but I may I may pass over to Faye Perbrick. Um, so uh, I think the, co the COVID period is uh, has been a financial strain for everyone. Clearly, the strain on uh, counties has been through additional services of social care, um, providing um, uh, the, 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 the the additional care home that we provided in in Henford Court and and supporting our our care home workers through PPE and everything. So so we all know that the cost to us is roughly about forty seven and a half million pound. The impact upon districts is very different. It's about loss of income um, in terms of car parking and licensing and fees and those sorts of things. So we do have different sides are probably of the same coin. Um, I think the point that, uh, that the districts have recognised and, and that you I can send you lots of uh, lots of uh, 
press articles uh, on this and I can also send you the LGA's view which is that uh, districts have been severely impacted by this loss of income uh, and there are a number now that are at risk of going to that uh, dreaded 114. Um, so whilst we've got high sustainability it is districts across the county which I think uh, have taken the greatest hit and I think that is reflected in the business case. Uh, Faye I don't know if you wanted to add to that at all. Thanks David. Um, Mike, I'm not quite sure which page of the um, of, of the business case you're you're reflecting on. Um, the one that I'm looking at is page 104 of the full council um, papers, page um, 30 of the business case, which refers to a particular um, impact amount that some South Somerset District Council exec reported on the 4th of June in one of their papers of a, a potential 10.4 million impact, which is 68% of their annual net revenue budget. Um, that's just something that has, has come through the financial papers um, over the course of the of the last couple of months. I think that the key thing for me is that the robustness of any future council is actually in the strengths uh, across everything. Um, if you look at the the spending and the budgets of um, councils across Somerset, uh, about 84% of that spending comes from the the um, county council. Um, uh, the rest of it being made up by the district councils. Uh, so obviously any impact on those smaller district council budgets has a much wider um, impact across their whole area um, be because of the, the, the size of those budgets themselves. So what, what um, a one Somerset unitary council will do is deliver that robustness of everything together um, and offsetting one another uh, and supporting across those budgets. And obviously the, the efficiencies and better outcomes of, of key departments working together um, for the, the best things for people and place across Somerset. Thank you. I'm going straight to Christine Lawrence, please, next. Councillor Christine uh, Lawrence. Thank you, Chairman. I'm Christine Lawrence. I'm the County Council of the Dancer Division. And on a very practical level, I just want to talk for two, two minutes about how we learn from the past and how I feel I want to make a real difference to our residents in the future. We've learned such a lot from COVID that we need to hold on to all those learning curves. When you think about contact centres, we have three of them run by district councils, one from Oxfordshire and we run, and we run our own. We duplicate each other. We brought it all together through COVID we had 7,207 people phone in, get the help they needed, and were, we were able to follow them up. If we can do it for an emergency, we can do it on a regular basis. And we need to be thinking much more about what needs our communities will have in the future and how we can serve them best. I think the business case for Somerset is the beginning of the door opening for us to look even more thoroughly at how we're going to do that, that we can make Somerset a really special supported community. Thank you. Right, I'm going to move straight to Josh Williams. I know he's a long way away in Scotland and may not have um, good accessibility. So, Josh, if you've got a quick point, because I'm going to start drawing this to a close. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I know there's been a lot of comments uh, on this today, but I feel that I need to express my view as, as it's one that I'm quite passionate about. Um, despite those saying that they support the principle, uh, but not the business case, I don't think I've heard any robust reasons why um, they should be against this business case, and we're still yet to see any alternatives. The business case before us is actually a very positive vision of the future of local government in Somerset, and I think that we should embrace it. Um, but one of the points I did want to bring up is this idea of pack accountability that I don't think has actually been mentioned. Um, the two-tier system we have duplicates work, it's inefficient, represents poor value for money for the taxpayer, and creates confusion amongst the electorate on what council is responsible for what. Um, and this confusion is coupled with an inherent blame culture between institutions 
That means despite more elected councillors, I would argue it's actually less democratic as no one is willing to take responsibility. And these issues, which I've experienced myself as a local councillor, uh, range from grass not being cut because the councils can't agree on who is responsible, to road closures leaving less disabled parking in the town centre, which is requested by the district, granted by the county, hated by the community. Um, and yet there is no accountability as the respective councils blame each other for the unpopular decision. And this example of disabled parking, I think, is a good example of why a two-tier system can actually create very poor outcomes for our communities and the most vulnerable. And the people I've spoken to feel that the current system muddies the water in terms of accountability. They um, approach one authority to express their concern. They're then told to go to the other and they do so and then are told to go back to the first authority. And that's, that, that's not right. I think there's a real sense of frustration that the public are removed from the decisions of their councillors. And recently I've had a number of people approach me wanting to be involved in the parish council, motivated by our one Somerset proposal for a single unitary. They see that parishes will have the opportunity to be involved in shaping and strengthening our local communities. Um, and they also see that they'll have the opportunity to be more heavily involved in the decisions that matter to them through the local community networks. And when I speak to people in my division about the proposal, they're actually surprised that we still have a two-tier system. They want a single point of contact. They want one council, not five, and they want us to get on with it. So I think we should move to the vote some at some point soon. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move straight to Councillor Jane Locke now, please. Sorry, Chair, just unmuting. Thank you. Um, and you may have to bear with me for a, a minute or two. There's quite a lot of sort of lots of messages coming up on chat. I'm not sure if that's an appropriate use of chat in this meeting. I thought we were supposed to be using it for procedural matters, but um, perhaps people could stop muddling things up. Um, I begin by making it very clear that the Liberal Democrat group absolutely accepts the need for change in the way services are delivered across the county. And we know the Secretary of State will make the final decision rather than as it should have been the people of Somerset. And as elected councillors, I'm sure we will all work to make sure that the outcome decided will work in the best way possible for our county and its residents. Ensuring local democracy thrives and accountability and transparency isn't lost. I fear that the suggestion for towns, cities and parishes is just passing responsibility without any assurance of funding. Earlier this morning, and it seems like a long time ago, um, the leader referred to car parking in Taunton and South Somerset. Shock horror. Um, they, they, one's charging at the moment and one isn't. However, I fear by the measures suggested that what you're going to do is find towns and, and, and or cities um, actually against each other. I mean, just think if Wells decided to charge, but Street decided not to charge, or Taunton decided to charge and Wellington decided not to charge. There's going to be a lot of confusion passed down for all sorts of people and all sorts of services. We can't support the business case today that's before us. We've had Buckinghamshire, Dorset and Wiltshire held up as examples and told continually that Somerset would learn lessons from each of them. And having read their business cases, I'm clear the only lesson learned is not to be too prescriptive and run the risk of being caught out in commitments, as has happened to those authorities. Buckinghamshire already into enormous external borrowing, Wiltshire's failure to build the promised hubs and the area boards little more than grant giving bodies and Dorset Cabinet voting for no area boards at all. This luck, luster, generic business case is riddled with inaccuracies and flaws and does not represent the reality of the County Council finances or does it know the detail of the, of the District Council's finances. If it's accepted, we will be the largest planning authority in the country. Break that down how you will, it's still going to be the largest planning authority in the country. Delivering services from the border of Cuba, the county used to be Avon, through to the border of Devon in a wonderful and diverse county such as ours is difficult enough without added pressures. You talk about being disingenuous and refer to the Liberal Democrats who had no option than to, as you, you well know, had no option than to borrow for capital investment. Unlike the last 10 years when the Tories have sold off £80 million worth of taxpayer assets, one off sales lost forever. The decision will be made today, I've no doubt about that, and change will come. But this is not the best Somerset County Council could do, and I think sends a weak message to the Secretary of State about our ambitions for Somerset. Thank you. 
Right, I'm going now to Councillor David Huxtable. Chairman, oops. Uh, Chairman, thank you. Um, it's been a very long, very interesting debate, and I thought I would just add a little historical um, uh, perspective to it. I'm, I'm the longest serving member, so I'm very happy to listen to all new ideas. And in fact, I've been involved in two of these debates in the past. The first one I voted for and the second one, which I have to seem to remember, was proposed by some of our senior colleagues on the other side of the council. I, I voted against. So I, I'm a bit of a floating voter on Unitary and I, and I actually um, actually do regret the, the loss of the county council, which has been going for about 140 years, whereas all the districts, as somebody pointed out, have been going since 74. Um, I now see a clear way forward for unitaries, uh, which is why I voted against last time, because last time there weren't many models of unitary authority, and now we're actually surrounded by them. So that has made my mind up. And I'm also minded to the fact that um, uh, adult social care is already a unitary authority. We have, uh, we have more staff working in district council offices than the district councils. And I was... Um, Alarmed, I, su I suspect it was a throwaway line, but I've just read the business case that some of the comments that the chief executive of South Somerset sent forward, where he dis where he, one of his throwaway lines, I can only assume it was a throwaway line, was that um, the demand on adults and children's social care will outstrip all the savings proposed anyway. Well, <laughs> uh, if that is the case, and I would certainly disagree with him, on, uh, certainly on adults, um, we uh, we are all doomed, but we cannot stay as we are. So, Chairman, I've listened very carefully, um, and I now feel that it's time that I would officially like to call for the vote. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Huxtable. So I note that you have officially called for the vote. Um, we are now. I'm now going to ask Scott to administer that. Yeah, chair, point of order. I'm saying, Hang Chair, chair I, know, I know before we move to the vote, I know there's the opportunity to have a seconder uh, who's reserved the right to speak. Yeah. So I was with the Councillor Purbury. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to make a final comment before we move to the vote. Councillor Purbury. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's been really great to hear so much passion, debate and commitment from councillors present here today. It's about getting it right for Somerset and that's why we're all here. Um, I'd just like to refer back to, to some of Councillor Locke's um, comments in her, her earlier question. Um, the inaccuracies and flaws, I think that's a, a really big misrepresentation. There have been a number of occasions where we've discussed finances through and given reassurances to members. Um, they've had the opportunity to speak to our 151 officer to address any concerns over the last five days since the last session, and no one has come forward to do so. So I think that's a really disingenuous um, thing to suggest. But it, it's, it's one of a number of different attacks this proposal has suffered over the last few weeks, including being the cheapest but costing too much, a risky experiment but based on an old-fashioned approach. And it strikes me that there seems to be a bit of confusion, but hopefully today's session, um, I think the sixth with members, has cleared all of this up. Those against One Somerset have said that they want to address opportunities for children and young people, the challenges for our ageing population, climate emergency, housing issues, the, econ um, the economy from economic development to skills and wages. And everybody who's read the One Somerset business case will see the exact same ambitions identified. Not just platitudes, but real ambition and vision to bring it all together, the people, the skills and the leverage that can actually affect this change. So we need to focus our efforts on outcomes and results for people and businesses, not on coordination and negotiation between really talented people across five authorities, all trying to do the best job they can, but hampered by the varying priorities, strategies and budget constraints. We need to spend our time focused on what can happen when we get there, not arguing on the journey to reaching these goals, not trying to sling mud or discredit one another, but recognising the strengths of a coordinated approach to improving lives and our environment, living well for longer, bringing together elements like housing and social care, leisure and public health. The list goes on and on. 
And if we can't see those connections and the benefits of bringing together those two tier uh, services will do for the people of Somerset, it really doesn't bode well for joined up outcomes. We need, as a number of people have said today, to think strategically and act locally, really locally in our communities. And this one Somerset proposal can deliver that. So the next step for a better future for Somerset is to submit this business case to the Secretary of State. And I call on all councillors who believe in Somerset, its people, its potential, and those who want a better future, those who know that staying as we are is not an option and who want to improve lives to support these recommendations and vote for. Councillor Locke. Chairman, I was referred to by name, so I think um, and, and called disingenuous, so I think I probably ought to respond. We are not saying for one minute we don't accept change. I've made that very clear. But we don't think this business case is good enough. We don't think this business case is good enough for Somerset or its residents. Um, I wasn't referring to the finances in the flaws in a, uh, or in accuracies. I simply pointed out that it wasn't representing the reality or the full details of the district council's um, finances, which is probably more important. The flaws and inaccuracies about the um, substance of the report. Um, at one example is that um, it claims that SEND services in two tier counties are um, poor because they're two tier authorities, when in fact the Ofsted report this year in 2020 actually doesn't mention two-tier authorities at all. It says SEND services are poor in um, metropolitans and unitaries. So Somerset has actually bucked the trend on that one and has managed to produce poor SEND services all by itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Lock. Councillor Fothergill to uh, make some read. Comments? The, I, I, well, I think we need to move to the vote. It has been called, it has been proposed, it has been seconded. Um, now is the moment. Um, I think we all need to take that brave decision. Um, this is not, and I've heard it described in various places, in district councils, uh, in various other forums, this is not Fothergill's plan. This is the plan of Somerset County Council, and in a few moments' time, I genuinely hope that it will become our adopted policy, because I think this is the best way to deliver improvements in services, improvements in life and improvements in public services to the people of Somerset. And we really do need to support it. I call upon all councillors to support this business case as we submit it to the Secretary of State. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. I'm going to now hand to the monitoring officer because we need to check a few things and he needs to make a statement. Thank you, Chair. Again, uh... I'm just conscious that I think a few members may have had some minor connectivity points, so I shall pause before I move to going through the voting procedure. If any members have had any minor uh, connectivity issues and feel they may have missed uh, a particular point, can you indicate before we uh, move to the vote? If you use the chat or hands up feature before I do that, John Thorne has commented in the chat. Councillor Chilcott, you're saying something? Yeah, I just noted a comment from John Thorne in the chat about that uh, issue. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Chilcott. We're aware of that. We've got a live monitoring there, please. So, so therefore, Councillor Thorne, I believe you've confirmed that you don't feel you've, uh, you've missed any key points or you've got sufficient evidence in which to inform your decision. That's what I believe you're saying. Uh, so therefore, just a reminder, again, uh, all members, clearly you have the benefit of all the evidence that's been presented. You have the benefit of the debate. Uh, I've obviously made reference to uh, the submission we had from South Somerset. Um, you also have obviously had uh, regards to the equalities impact assessments as well, prior to uh, taking any uh, decision today. Uh, as stated before, um, you've already agreed an amendment. That amendment is already now forming part of the recommendations before you. Uh, but just as a recap, for the benefit of both members and also the members of the public, uh, you'll know that the recommendations are for the council to approve the one Somerset business case, and that's set out in Appendix O, to authorise the leader of the council to submit the business case to the Secretary of State of the Ministries of Housing, Communities and Local Government, 
for a decision on the future of local government in Somerset and authorise the Leader of the Council to submit further supporting evidence arising from ongoing engagement, future consultation and any requests including in the pending invitation from the Secretary of State for the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government relating to this one Somerset business case and finally to agree to support the Leader of the Council continuing to seek consensus with the district and local councils across Somerset towards the creation of a new single tier unitary council for Somerset. At that point, I shall now commence the named votes. I shall call you all individually. As I call your name, you can either use chat or you can switch your microphone on. Either way, can you indicate yes if you're in favour, no if you're against, or abstain if you're abstaining from. And I'll be proposing clearly that all of those four recommendations are taken on block together. So I shall start first with Councillor Best. No. Councillor Bloomfield? Four. Councillor Bown? Four. Councillor Clayton? <coughs> Abstain. Councillor Caswell? Abstain. Councillor Chilcott? Four. Councillor Clark? No. Councillor Coles? No. <coughs> Councillor Dance? No. Councillor Dimmery? Councillor Dimmery? Councillor Dimmery? Are you on mute, yeah. Councillor Dimmery? It would not be sorry. Councillor Dimmery, if you want to use the chat or no, I'm your okay. Can you hear me now? I can. Councillor yeah. Dimmery? It didn't work. I'm against. Councillor Filmer? Abstain. Councillor Fothergill? Councillor Fashini? For I think my I think my microphone, sorry, it's Councillor Fothergill. My microphone wasn't switched on at the time. I would just like it to be recorded that mine is a vote for. For sorry. Scott, Scott was you're on mute. You've gone very faint. I can't hear you. Was that Councillor Govier? Oh yeah, yes. Councillor Grosscott? Yes. Councillor Hall? Four. Councillor Ham? Four. Councillor Healy? Four. Councillor Hewitt Cooper? Councillor Hewitt Cooper? Sorry, problem with the uh, mute button. I'm for the motion. Thank you. Councillor James Hunt? Four. Councillor John Hunt? Four. Councillor Huxtable? Four. Councillor Keating? Four. Councillor Kendall? Against. Councillor Lawrence? Four. Councillor Lewis? Four. Councillor Lashaw. Against. Councillor Jane Lock. Against. Councillor Tony Lock. Against. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Munt. Against. Councillor Napa. Councillor Napa. Councillor Napa. Chairman, I think we had a message earlier that Terry Napper had had to leave the meeting. You'll be aware that he was receiving treatment until last week. Yeah. Uh, so should, we call, uh, should we call? I should recall Councillor uh, Napper is absent from the vote. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Noel. Yes, four. Councillor Oliver. 
Councillor Oliver. At four. Councillor Parham. Four. Councillor Paul. Four. Councillor Pryor Sankey. Against. Councillor Pullin. Four. Councillor Purbrick. Four. Councillor Redman. Abstain. Councillor Evans. Against. Councillor Ruddle. Against. Councillor Taylor. Four. So Councillor Thornus report recorded to be voting yes. Four. Four. Councillor Verdon. Four. Councillor BJ. Four. Councillor Wallace. Four. Councillor Wedekop. Against. Councillor Josh Williams. Four. <clears throat> Councillor Rod Williams. Four. Councillor John Woodman. Four. Should you just count up the votes? So I've just double checked. So therefore, in terms of the recommendations related to the one Somerset business case, all of those recommendations are carried by majority. The votes recording 33 votes for, 14 votes against, and four abstentions. Therefore, all of those recommendations are agreed by the council. Chair? Thank you, councillors. I'm now mindful of the time. It's just uh, before quarter past two, so we're going to have a 20 minute break due to take some for lunch. So if you could all be back here online at 25 to three, please. Thank you, councillors. And councillors and, and any, uh, any others who are connected to the meeting, can I ask that you switch your video off and you also go on to mute whilst we go on to the lunch breaks, please.
Right, good afternoon uh, again, councillors. I trust you've all suitably refreshed and everybody's back with us. Well, I hope they are. Um, we're now going to move, move to the Treasury Management Outturn Report 2019-20. That's paper B in your papers. And I'm going to invite Councillor Mandy Chilcott to introduce the item and speak as the proposer. Councillor Mandy Chilcott, please. <clears throat> Sorry, coughing fit right at that moment. Good afternoon, councillors. Mike, OK to start. Sorry. Yes, the floor is yours, councillor. Thank you. Excuse me for that. So this is the annual Treasury Management Outturn for 1920. This is paper B and starts on page 211 of your papers. Excuse me, I've got to grab a drink. Chairman, it does look like uh, Councillor Chilcott has rushed back to her seat. Should we just give her just 30 seconds to catch her breath? Because it is a really important paper. And, and Thank I, I, you. I, I, I had someone at the door, so uh, lots going on. Right, I'm fine. So this report is a requirement and has been prepared in full compliance with the SIPFA Treasury Management Code and covers the Treasury Management Activity for 2019 to 20. It details any Treasury Management actions, capital financing, debt and investment activity and confirms compliance with Treasury limits and prudential indicators. This paper was taken to Cabinet on the 20th of July for approval and submission to today's full Council meeting. Moving to the body of the report, in Table 1 on page 215, it shows the total debt at the end of March remained the same as at the end of March 20. So between March 19 and March 20, it remained the same. There was no new debt taken during the year. The total debt stood at 324 million, 0.55, borrowed at an average interest rate of 4.66%. Moving forward to table three on page 216, this shows our total investments at 31st of March 20 as being 184 million. This figure reflects our internal borrowing and would have been 31.7 million pounds higher if this was not done. If any internal borrowing is externalized by taking out a loan, the level of external debt would increase but the level of investments would also increase by the same amount. The internal borrowing is based upon sound advice from Arlen Close, our Treasury advisors. This approach provides the best value for our residents by managing our own funds wisely, not incurring unnecessary interest charges, whilst at the same time minimising the credit risk to this council. The figures in this table also include Somerset County Council cash, as well as funds managed for others, including the Local Enterprise Partnership and Exmoor National Park. In February this year, a further £5 million was invested in the CCLA Property Fund. In conclusion, I would also like to give an update to Council. As mentioned previously, our 1819 accounts and the work of Grant Thornton, our auditors, was subject to review by the Financial Reporting Council. This was part of the work being undertaken across the country to drive improvement in auditing standards for private and public accounts. The FRC has now completed their work and there have been no issues found. There is no higher assurance that this council can gain and this reconfirms that our statement of accounts are correct. My thanks again go to the finance team and to the author of the report, Alan Sanford, for a well-written, clear and understandable report and for their continued hard work and dedication. Thank you. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Councillor. I'm now going to invite uh, Councillor Mike Lewis uh, as your seconder to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Mike Lewis, 
I wish to second the report and uh, reserve my right to reply. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. I apologise. We're now experiencing a delay at our end. Uh, so I'm now going to invite council members to speak. Um, so any councillors wish to make comments, please? Liz Leishon, please. Councillor Liz Leishon. I'm not seeing you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, apologies if this is my error, but I understand Councillor Chilcott's explanation of internal borrowing, and I welcome that. My question is, is that shown fully and transparently in the Treasury Management Report? Because until I asked the direct question, I couldn't actually see that figure. So if it is transparent in the report, my apologies. If it isn't, please may I ask if it will be full and transparent in future years? Thank you. Thank you. Just to respond to that question, I think it is there. It's shown in the investments. And like I said, if one went up, the other would come down. So it's absolutely there. Is there a separate dialogue in the report? No, there isn't. But to be very clear, this report is absolutely done as it should be. I've had a look around and some councils, county councils, do put a separate reporting line in and some don't, but either are perfectly acceptable. Um, but you, it won't change the figures in the report is what I'm saying. It's there and it's reflected in what's there. I, thank you, Chair. Uh, if I may just come back, I, I do understand that and I do understand that the officers' work is good and sound and I also commend them for their very important work. I just think in these days where we're all looking at uncertain futures, that it is really important that every council is fully transparent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Leishon. Um, are there any other councillors that would like to raise comments or make, uh, make inquiries, please? No, nobody's coming forward. I think in that case, I would now normally ask for Councillor Chilcott and or Jason Vaughan to ask, answer any questions raised. But there, seeing as there are no questions raised and seeing as there doesn't appear to be a debate, I'm, I'm going to move straight to the vote. So I will ask Scott to run this, please. Yeah, and again, members are reminded uh, this is the standard voting procedure that you used earlier on in the meeting. So all I require are members to indicate in chat that they are in favour or against the recommendations that are presented. Agree and bow. Thank you, Councillor Bow. There's a pause just as I'm watching the uh, votes coming in. Oh, you've counted numbers. One, two, three. You've got five. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, apologies for the delay again. I'm just uh, just checking in terms of the remainder. I know there are a number of abstentions, but also a majority in. Or I can see, I, from what I can count, there are a majority in favour. Uh, therefore, it's uh, verbally shown. If you want to. Yeah, Chairman votes for. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman uh, confirmed he's voting for the recommendations. Um, therefore, looking at the responses I've received so far, I would suggest therefore that these recommendations are passed by a majority. And therefore, Chairman, we now move on to the next item of business. Which is the Corporate Parenting Board. Okay. Okay. 
Right, item nine, uh, the corp Somerset Corporate Care. Sorry, Chair, and... apologies, Chair, that's me, uh, that, that's me uh, throwing you. It's a uh, yeah. report to the Monash Council. Well, I thought eight. it was. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we have a technical glitch. Here. I to make surely, Chair. <laughs> it's kind of you to bear with me. It's uh, Right, item eight is the report of the monitoring officer. Um, this is the appointments to committees and the empowerment of deputy statutory officer posts. Scott Woodridge, as monitoring officer, please. Thank you, Chair. I know the uh, I know the leader, and uh, together with the opposition group leader, will also want to, to speak on these items. I suppose just to assist all members, um, particularly in terms of the report you've had before you. You will know that I have uh, recently uh, just published the detailed list of uh, appointments. Uh, and highlighted on that appointment schedule in red are where there are some changes since the last time that the council considered appointments, which was back in January this year. You'll see from the report uh, the principal reason for the, uh, the need for this, uh, the changes in committee places, results from a change to some of the political groups. Uh, and as a result of that, the recalculation of committee places was required to be done and therefore presented to today's meeting for the council's approval. That includes within it uh, some of the committee places, the uh, position approval to appoint the vice chair of the audit committee. And again, that's set out uh, within that appointment schedule. In addition to the member appointments to the various committees of the council, the report also sets out proposals in relation to some statutory officer posts, and these are in relation to deputies. Those are both a additional deputy section 151 officer, together with two additional deputy directors of adult social services. And again, the details behind those proposed appointments are set out in the report, uh, but fundamentally they are put forward to council to agree, uh, primarily to provide resilience to the organisation, to ensure that those statutory functions can be undertaken should the substantive post holders, either the statutory section 151 or the statutory director of adult social services, in instances where they are unable to act, such as when they're on holiday or on sick leave. At that point, Chair, I shall uh, pause for uh, Councillor Fothergill and for Councillor Locke to also uh, speak in relation to the report. Thank you. Councillor Fothergill. Um, thank you very much indeed, Chairman, and also the monitoring officer. I've got uh, very little to add. Um, I think uh, that it's uh, it, it, the, the recommendations are very clear in front of us, and that um, and I, I seek to move them. Um, I would, of course, uh, when when the vote goes through, hopefully I would welcome uh, Donna Parham to the role, and of course also Anna Littlewood and Tim Baverstock, who we all know as well. So uh, I think some good appointments, and I'm delighted that uh, we reschedule in our committee appointments. So I, I, I do recommend to the council for approval. Councillor Jane Locke, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm very happy to second these recommendations and uh, like the leader when the vote goes through welcome the new post holders to their roles and hope that they make um, they, they strengthen the teams here in at Somerset County Council um, now and in the future thank you thank you councillor no, I'm now going to go to councillor David Huxtable who would like to speak Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, just to comment on the, the, the new appointments of Anna Littlewood and Tim Baverstock. Um, I would have to say we know we know Tim very, very well, and he's done a fantastic job over the years. And I'm absolutely delighted that he has has taken up this position. Um, I would say he faced, he faced stiff competition uh, for his position, which I think will gratify him. Um, and the position of Anna Littlewood, also, also a, a very fiercely contested uh, battle. Uh, I, what I, my comment would be, my, my, my statement would be, um, 
in the past, these have been quite difficult positions to fill in care. Um, care has not been popular uh, and care in Somerset has had a bit of a checkered history. I was delighted to see the standard of all the candidates who wish to come us because we've now achieved almost na we've, we've now achieved national recognition for the work that we've been doing over the last few years in Somerset. And this has been reflected in the, the, the calibre of people who want to come and join us. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Huxtable. There being no other questions, and I see nothing raised in the chat or the hands, I'm going to move it straight to the vote. So I'm going to ask uh, the monitoring officer to run that, please. Thank you, Chair. And again, members, if you could use the chat feature or your uh, microphones just to indicate whether you are voting yes or for, or no or against, or to abstain. Agree, Councillor Baum. Thank you, Ryan Brown. Thank you. Again, in terms of members present, I would uh, say record a majority in favour of the recommendations. Therefore, those recommendations are approved by Council. Shall we then move on to the next item, which is the report of the Corporate Parenting Board, um, which I believe uh, Jill Johnson, as the Chair, was going to introduce. Thank you. Jill Johnson, are you, in the, uh, are you online with us? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, and welcome to the meeting. Thank you very much, Jill. You're, you're, you're very clear. Uh, I'm introducing you as the chair of the Somerset Corporate Parenting Board, and you're going to introduce the item as set out on the pages 257 to 317. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you again for inviting me along. And thank you particularly for it being such um, a prompt um, meeting for this report this year. We were very late last year and we've been, I think, in the following meeting we've gone for next year. So that's very good. Um, the report is, stands by itself. Uh, you've had a very busy morning, so I won't dwell on too many issues. Um, just to say that for those of you that didn't get towards the end of the report, there is an addendum right at the very back of the report um, to give uh, a little bit of a detail on um, the work that's been going on during the COVID outbreak. And um, I echo members' views at the beginning of this meeting. Um, my thanks to all the staff and volunteers, etc., who, and particularly the foster carers, who've worked so hard to keep our young people safe. Um, you'll see that there is one recommendation with four parts. Um, particularly, I'd like um, to look at the council tax exemption again across the county. We do have considerable inconsistency, which is disappointing, um, and we want to have the best for our care leavers. Um, in addition to that, um, again, we, we are looking again at district representation and um, Councillor Nicholson and myself have agreed that we would like to make this annual report present this annual report to district councils to see if we can improve on that representation or, or get some representation for the districts. And um, finally, the, the last recommendation for you is to um, support care leavers and with practical work offers. We've done really well at getting apprenticeships sorted out for care leavers and um, we want to make sure that that continues. Um, and the last thing I want to say, Chairman, is once again, our in-care councils, they do an awful lot of work that quite a lot of it goes unseen. Um, but it's such important work because it helps to drive us forward as an authority and, and um, as a collection of bodies looking after these young people. So huge thanks again to them. And uh, to all the staff, once again, thank you very much for everything you've done during the pandemic. That's all. 
Thank you very much indeed. And, and as usual, thank you for the time that you give to this. I'm sure that we're all gratefully appreciative. I'm going to move now to Councillor Francis Nicholson to speak as the proposer. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I am delighted to uh, propose the annual report uh, from the Corporate Pairing Team Board as presented by its chairman, independent chairman, Jill Johnson. And I want to echo every word that she's said um, and the thanks to the staff, to above all the children and all our partners who support the children and the, all the schools that support them and all the health services that support them and all the employers and the mentors and on it goes. And where it happens, right, is certainly the support of district councils who are, after all, in the same legal position as we are, they are corporate parents of the children in care in Somerset. So I'm grateful to them for their work in terms of housing. But a, a one word I want to add, um, uh, which Jill hasn't mentioned, which is my thanks to her, because she has driven the work of the Corporate Parenting Board, I think, even more than the children. And just occasionally, the children representatives on the Corporate Parenting Board tell her off for being too fierce. But I am so grateful for that and so grateful for her dedication and determination to see that our role as corporate parents is properly carried out and our children are properly supported. And as the part that the Corporate Parenting Board takes in improvement for children in this county. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, uh, Francis Nicholson, Councillor. Uh, I'm going to call on Councillor Lee Redmond now to speak as the seconder. Lee Redmond, please. Chair, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I ha happily to support the comments of both previous speakers and happy to second with the right to respond if required. Councillor David, David Fothergill. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, 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 I really would just like to say a big thank you to Jill Johnson. Um, I think that she uh, she is an excellent chair of this board. And um, some people thought I was a little bit mad uh, asking a previous Lib Dem leader to, to chair the board for us. Uh, I'm delighted to say that Jill has approached it in a non-partisan way and non-political way. She has just been uh, really, really good news for the children of Somerset in chairing this board. Uh, and I would like to play tribute to her and thank her for all the work that she has done and for keep flying the flag uh, for children here in the county. So thank you, Jill. Uh, we appreciate your help. And we appreciate the way that you do the job. Thank you. Councillor Mandy Chilcott. Thank you. I would echo the previous speaker's uh, comments. Um, but just to say also, could we really send our thanks to Sick and Slick? Uh, they're two groups of young people that do a huge amount of work with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, what I would do is encourage any councillor to get involved in the Corporate Parenting Board. And I would think there's nothing uh, more powerful than when you hear young people talk about their challenges and what we need to do to help them as a council. So, you know, if you're interested, please uh, get involved with the Corporate Parenting Board. Our youngsters are wonderful, but they do need our help and support. Thank you. Councillor Liz Leishon. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say that I do fully recognise the recommendation on the inconsistency of council tax exemption. I just wanted to make the point I, I did... Um, intervene to sort out a case recently at Mendep and I don't think this is lack of intent I think it was lack of understanding and it is something that I'm sure all the districts intend to put right uh, and end up on the um, on the same basis as I believe Sedgemoor already is so please don't think this was lack of intent it was misunderstanding I and mean, lots of us are committed to putting this right thank you chair Thank you, Councillor Nation. Councillor uh, Jane, please. I've, I've, I've reached a pinnacle now. I'm just known by one name. It's marvellous. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Absolutely. We need to thank everyone and, and particularly the kids who um, put so much into the um, Corporate Parent Board. Uh, and I'm sorry that I haven't been able to attend um, quite so often with the personal health reasons um, and COVID and all sorts of other things sort of get in the way. Um, David, um, when the small charity that I chair gave the £3,000 for the awards for the um, children in care last year you promised me that you would make sure that the county council picked that up and that it would no longer be cut from the budget and I, I understand it may well be a different format this year but can I just be assured that you have um, kept to that please um, I will that that was my undertaking at the time of course I'll make sure that that is uh, the undertaking and leave that with me Jane and I'll come back to you Thank you very much. Um, in the um, recommendations, the recommendation that says the council supports the commitment by Somerset County Council to create practical and specific offers to care leavers through our local offer. Now, the local offer, um, if it's the local offer that I'm understanding it is, is around SEND. And no, um, no it's a different local offer. Mm. Right, that's fine. Um, I, I was just going to make sure that it was extended to children beyond the um, SEND understanding. Um, certainly local offer is, is my understanding of that. Um, I, I know it's probably not possible to put in this, this year, um, but I am constantly disappointed for the children um, with the results they get in GCSEs and beyond. And um, I'm hoping that Perhaps I can ask you through this um, report to make sure that um, we have regular updates at corporate parents and that we do all we can to support children who will have missed a lot of education through COVID and um, to get back into um, education. Thank you. Councillor Francis Nicholson, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Yes, uh, as Jane, uh, I think, probably knows, um, the Corporate Parenting Board has a subgroup um, for uh, around education, and this is the governing board for the virtual school for children looked after, which has seen changes and improvements, and I think will continue to do so. Yes, our ambition is that um, that uh, the attainment of children looked after. Uh, should match their abilities and their potential, just as with any other child. Uh, and uh, ha absolutely happy to um, brief Jane separately, should, uh, should that uh, uh, be something she would like. Uh, and also to say, yes, the, the, there is a local offer for care leavers. This is not the SEND local offer. And uh, we are, as a county council, a, a signatory Chief Executive has signed us up to, um, not all on his own, with everybody's support, uh, to the Care Leavers Charter um, and th the working commitments that that brings in Somerset, um, all of which I'm happy to talk to Jane about um, as and when she'd like. Thank you. Um, now, just to remind you all of the recommendations, the Corporate Parenting Board requests one, that Council recommends a focus on the inconsistency of Council tax exemption across the county and the impact of this on care leavers. Two, that Council invites District Council representations on the Corporate Parenting Board to provide support on housing and leisure issues. Three, that the Council supports the commitment by Somerset County Council to create practical and specific offers to care leavers through our local offer. And finally, that the Council extends its thanks to the young people of the Somerset Care Council for all the hard work that they undertake. These are the recommendations, and I'm going to ask Scott to move it to the vote, please. Thank you, Chair, and again, uh, members, if you could indicate again, uh, either using your microphone or using the chat uh, to indicate whether you are for, agree, or whether you are against, or whether you wish to abstain. Agreed. Thank you, Councillor Wallace.
Chairman, can I, can I, it's David Fothergill, can I just point out that the letter R on my computer isn't working? I don't want people to think that I've suddenly become uh, I'm very bad at spelling, but uh, every time I hit the letter R, it doesn't appear. So, uh, so I apologise for that, but I think you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Try the letter Y. <laughs> Again, for the benefits of both uh, public and members, that uh, all recommendations that were proposed are agreed by majority and therefore they are passed. Jeremy, we then move on to the next business, which are items of information. Uh, so we have now completed the decision items. Okay. Thank you, Scott. This is item 10, report of the leader and cabinet, the items for information. Item 10 is to be introduced by Councillor David Fothergill, the leader of the council. Uh, thank going you. To, I'm going to just advise that the item is for noting only, and this is where members' questions to, to cabinet members will be considered. No member questions were received in advance of this meeting, and I will now in, invite Councillor Fothergill to begin and invite members' questions. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman, um, and I will take questions first uh, as the first report coming up. And also you will notice that I have published uh, the annual report um, under, uh, I think it's item 11. So I'll take questions for those. Um, and clearly, um, uh, if there is anything that anybody wishes to raise with me, please do off either of those reports. No. Mm -hmm. John Clark, Councillor John Clark. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, David, you on page three five five, you refer to the new challenges. Um, I I would suggest it's not new, but one of the challenges you're referring to is climate change, and you refer to the I was a very welcome creation of the one million pound climate change yep. fund for green initiatives. And you also speak of the need to regain pace and momentum around the challenges that the climate change will bring us. Can I ask you, can you tell us how you're proposing to regain this pace and what actions we can expect over the next few months or further on this year? Um, Recognising that one of the most, it, the climate change is one of the most challenging and urgent work which we need to take place. Although I appreciate the uh, urgency of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, which I may add, I feel that Somerset County has, has been exemplary in how it responded to that. So yes, if you could give me, I'm, and I'm happy to receive a, a full written answer in terms of possibly what used to be called an action plan. Um, and I'd also like to hear um, how you, the arrangements for actually um, authorities, parishes and towns uh, claiming for the climate change fund. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. And I'm I'm going to hand to uh, Claire Paul in a moment as the cabinet member responsible for climate change. So Claire will be able to give you full formal details in a moment. Uh, but can I just thank you for your kind words in response uh, on the county council's response to the COVID-19 uh, uh, um, pandemic that we've had. I too believe that the, the work of the county council and, and its employees has been exemplary, along with our partners. I think we've done an incredible job here in Somerset and I would include the districts uh, within that praise. So so uh, thank you. I, it's something that I completely align with. Um, and I also align with the fact that the, the climate change is one of the biggest challenges, if not the biggest challenge that we're going to face uh, as we hand, uh, hand this world on to our children. So I'll hand over to Claire to talk about the £1 million fund, how that's coming into being and how we intend to pick up pace. So Claire, if you're online, please. Yes, thank you, Leader. Thank you, John, for that. I'm happy to um, reiterate, really, what David has just said about our, our climate agenda being uh, hugely important to us all. And of course, it was uh, ongoing prior to COVID and has continued uh, under the surface during COVID. It's really, really exciting times for us all now uh, by way of the climate agenda. Our strategy is in its final elements, uh, just getting ready to go to the final task and finish to finalise that for the scrutinies and for all of the full councils in October. In terms of the climate fund, that's running alongside it too. And you will be looking to your town, parish and city councils to submit their bids 
by October. Thank you. Thank you. Members, are there any other questions for Councillor Fothergill, please, before I ask him to uh, present his annual report? Somebody's got a raised hand, Chairman. I can't see who that is. Uh, Hazel Price-Anke. Councillor Hazel Price-Anke, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask in terms of um, the message we just heard about the climate change stuff, where Thompson sits in all of that, given that we don't have a parish or a town or a city council at the moment? Thank you. Well, well, of course, Hazel, we, that's something that we're hoping to put right very soon, but I suspect not before October. Um, so I think that we, we will need to work with yourself and other local uh, local representatives to make sure that we can give Taunton an opportunity to bid into that fund. We wouldn't certainly wouldn't want it to miss out. So uh, can we set something that we can take offline? I think it's certainly something we need to do about. Maybe the Charter Trustees are the right way forward to work with the Charter Trustees. I, I'm sure it's one option for us. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up and uh, thank you for the suggestion. Thank you. Right, I'm going to move to the annual report, the uh, Councillor David Fothergill, and invite him to uh, present it now, please. Well, again, as it's been published, Chairman, I think that I'll just present it as as it is, uh, and I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, in terms of what's, what's, what's coming out from it. So uh, if there are any questions, very happy to take them. I'm not seeing any questions coming up for the leader. Or Jane Locke, your hands up. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, if we go down to 3.3 three and the send inspection, and it might just be a matter of language, um, I appreciate that, but it says the report identified significant weaknesses in the provision of send services, highlighted areas had already been identified by senior leaders through self-evaluation and work has already begun to address these. It reads as if they had already identified some of the things that were going wrong with SEND services, um, but actually they've only just started to do anything about it. Um, I hope that's not the case, um, but it might just be a matter of language. Thank you. I suspect, uh, if I can, Jane, that it is a matter of language. Clearly, we're constantly monitoring uh, all our services and ensuring that there is an ongoing process of improvement. Uh, I think it was just anticipating that we did expect and expect with the SEND uh, inspection that there would be issues which would be raised, and we, we were aware of them and already trying to tackle them. But I'll hand over to Francis, if Francis particularly wanted to, to add anything to that. Mr. Chairman, I don't think I need to add anything to that. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. I'm now going to move to Councillor Mandy Chilcote. Thank you. It's just whether there's any questions, really, from the report. Any questions for Councillor Mandy Chilcote at all, please? No, I see no hands, so I'm going to move to Councillor John Woodman, please. Any questions for Councillor John Woodman? I see nothing at all. Any questions for Councillor Francis Nicholson, please? John oh. Clark. Councillor John Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Nicholson, I just wanted to raise with you and ask you a question around our um, young carers. I wonder if you'd like to comment on, and bearing in mind that there's been significant changes in, in how the services run, I wonder if you'd like to comment on how the young carers have been supported during the period of um, COVID, although I appreciate to some extent that is continuing, and what efforts are being made to support young carers, particularly in terms of individual or uh, possibly face-to-face -face support or contact uh, uh, not purely on online, as it were, but actual contact with carers, because at the young carers, because at the present time, I suspect their social groups are no are not operating because of government guidance. So I wonder how that's been addressed, that, that deficit at the moment. I'd be, I'd be grateful to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman, if I may. Um, that's a very pertinent question. Um, as you know, 
um, young uh, children who have caring duties have a right to be assessed to see and, and to be assessed to see whether they need the sorts of support of uh, group activities and so on, or whether they in their own right need more support than that. Um, and in terms of uh, all the children who um, need support, and in this case, clearly young carers, um, most uh, most face to face work has been replaced and groups has been replaced by um, virtual groups. Now, for some young people, this is really helpful and they, they have found them helpful. And that's not only young carers, but others. Um, for others, it has been clear that uh, more support and face to face support was needed. And again, this goes across the whole of children's services. So uh, where it has been needed, where it is appropriate and where where the needs of the child require it, uh, face to face uh, support continues. Um, but clearly for the majority of them, uh, the groups have been replaced at the moment by virtual groups. For some, this is a really good thing. For some, it is not so good. But as again, I say, where, the, where there is need, face-to-face -face work happens. Thank you. Thank you, uh, councillors. I'm going to move to Councillor Claire Paul. If there's any questions for Claire. No questions at all. Right, in that case, Councillor David Hall, please. Any questions for David Hall? I don't see any indication at all, so I move to Councillor David Huxtable, please. I see no questions for Councillor Huxtable, so I'm moving to Councillor Christine Lawrence. Questions for Councillor Christine Lawrence, please. Nothing at all. And finally, Councillor Faye Purbrick. Any questions for Faye Purbrick, please? Nothing at all, I think. Uh, that's a very quiet time. You must have all ate lunch well and uh, feeling tired. So I'm going to ask you all to note the Leader and Cabinet's report for information and the annual report of the Leader of Council. And uh, that moves now to item 12 which is the report of the Scrutiny for Policies and Place Committee. It's going to be introduced by Councillor Anna Groskop, Chair of the Scrutiny for Policies and Place. Uh, the item is for noting only, and I now invite Councillor Anna Groskop to present key points for the report, please. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I owe my thanks to all the team, uh, especially Jamie Jackson, his support team, all the members of the committee and all the substitutes who have attended some very interesting topics we've had at Scrutiny in place. I would remind all members that Scrutiny doesn't, is not a decision-making body. It's used evidence to make recommendations to Cabinet, and we have managed to do that quite well this year because we've actually had the items come to Cabinet, come to scrutiny before they've gone to cabinet, which is quite something. I thank everyone, the report is before you, um, and that's it for me. Any questions, please, for Councillor Anna Groskop? Any questions at all, members? Councillor Mandy Chilcott. I'd just like to give my thanks really to, to Anna and the committee. Um, they have had a huge um, number of reports come to them over the years, certainly a lot of them being finance based. So I thank everybody for their questions, for their input and for also giving the feedback so that we can keep um, improving those reports as we move along. Councillor Liz Leishon, please. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Councillor Mandy Chilcott for always making the time to come to Scrutiny Place. It is very much appreciated that she takes the trouble to do so and answers questions wherever they come up. Thank you. Councillor David Fothergill. It's beginning to sound a bit like an Oscar speech of who we can thank next, but I would particularly like to thank uh, Anna Groskop and the committee members of the, uh, of the Scrutiny Place Committee. Um, 
they have shouldered a huge burden over the few months, um, not only uh, scrutinising the uh, the finances and everything, but most recently the one Somerset business case. Um, I have been hugely impressed with the way that uh, Anna runs that committee. Um, and uh, I would just really like to say on a very personal level, thank you to her, uh, but thank you to all the committee members that have put in so much time and effort uh, to, to really to, to stress test uh, our policies, but particularly the one Somerset policy. We really do appreciate it. Well, thank you, councillors. I must thank the Scrutiny Place Committee for, for their report and for all the work that they do, and it is appreciated. And I ask that this is now noted by council. I move to item 13, that's the report of the Scrutiny for Policies, Adults and Health Committee. It's going to be introduced by Council Hair Hazel Priosanke, Chair of the Scrutiny for Policies, Adults and Health Committee. The item is for noting only, and I'm going to now invite Council Hazel Priosanke to present the key points from her report. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, it's been a busy year and we've kept uh, going through the COVID crisis meeting remotely. And whilst it's strange, it has, I think, been fairly effective. Um, we've had a varied work programme over the, the year, and I would like to thank my team, the, the officers and uh, the all those people on the committee, Vice Chairman Mark Healy, and and uh, also our portfolio holders who turn up and uh, listen in and make comments appropriately. So thank you. I, I, I do believe in teamwork, and I think we work well as a team. Um, we have a, a varied work program going forward as well. We um, have. Uh, transformation for learning disabilities on the agenda in September and in October we were hoping to do it in August but um, things contrived to make that not really timely so in October we're going to have a workshop uh, for members on transition transition from children's services into adult services and that's a, often a, a time when when people get very upset and distressed and what we're going to be doing is looking at how our transitions work so you're all invited to be to be part of that if you want to be because I think it's a very important part of our work um, and also to thank health colleagues um, and we are um, whilst inevitably the last uh, couple of meetings have been focused on Covid to a greater extent and how that's impacted on our adult social care and on health but actually we need not to forget that health issues still go on and we've asked for some specific um, follow-up on cancer waiting times and dental health and that kind of thing at our next meeting because we realise it's important not to let the ball drop on that because um, it isn't all about Covid whilst that is sort of rather all-consuming at the moment. Happy to take any questions, thank you. We have a question from Councillor David Huxtable. Councillor Huxtable. Okay, so I don't think you're on mute. Councillor David Huxtable, are you on mute? Sad. Oh. So can that, you, know, can you hear me now? Yeah, it yes. just keeps flashing on and on, Mike. So I'd like to thank Hazel for two things, really. One, um, obviously for her chairmanship of the meetings we we very much appreciate her humor and even handedness but secondly and from my point of view rather more importantly she's enabled us all to uh, lose a bit of weight with these virtual meetings because we haven't had to eat hazel's buns um uh, i mean i try and resist but uh, some of hazel's um catering is is hard to resist and i'm sure we we we, we miss that in 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 this in this lockdown period thank you chairman thank you <laughs> thank you i knew that comment and a few other comments in the uh, in the side now which are interesting um right i'm going to move very quickly on to item 14 that is the report of the scrutiny for policies children and families committee it's going to be introduced by Councillor Lee Redman, who is Chair of the Scrutiny for Policies, Children and Families Committee. And again, I'm not advising you, this is for noting only. And I now invite 
Councillor Redmond to present the key points from his report. Chair, thank you. I submit, I submit this report to full council. It's interesting and timely, as yesterday was the 20th anniversary of the introduction of the Local Government Act 2000 that created overview and scrutiny committees with backbench councillors fulfilling an overview and scrutiny role. So a little belated, but happy 20th birthday scrutiny. I want to put on record my thanks to everyone that has taken the opportunity to participate in our meetings. I want to formally thank my vice chair for his support. Councillor Rod Williams has helped me see the wood from the trees. I wish to draw members' attention to my points in 2.1 of the report and comment that the committee has been remained mindful that it was created specifically to help improve children's services. We recognise the committee is still developing its modus operandi and look forward to the next year. I've always approached scrutiny as a critical friend. We are supportive of officers and encourage them to highlight areas of concern to us. Whilst we challenge poor performance or improvement that is too slow, we look to, for assurance that action is underway and that is being effective in producing the outcome we want. On occasion, we have supported requests for extra resource and have supported the adoption of new ways of working, particularly when Council collaborates with our agencies, with other agencies, to bring about improvement. However, we continue to believe that the committee's involvement in pre-decision scrutiny is too limited. We are keen that scrutiny's input to cabinet decisions increases. This was one of the recommendations of the Council-wide Scrutiny Review, whose recommendations, by the way, were agreed by full Council in November 2019 and is still not quite in place. Chair, I remind all members of their right to suggest areas for scrutiny. Members and officers are our eyes and ears. So please remember, we are as much your committee as that of the Council. Chair, enough of my wittering. Please accept the annual report, and I'm happy to take any questions should members have any. Councillor Lee Redmond, thank you very much for your sincere report. Councillors, any questions for Lee, please? If I may, thank you. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, I want to thank. Uh, Lee Redmond as Chair of, of Children's Scrutiny very much for the work that's gone on this year. Um, I know that it requires dedication, energy, commitment um, and careful thought. So I, I am extraordinarily grateful for that. Um, on the subject of, of, um, of the uh, changes and reforms to scrutiny that uh, Lee mentions, uh, I particularly want to point up the work that the Scrutiny Committee did uh, in the last year uh, on e exclusions from schools and, and lack of uh, lack of inclusion of children, um, particularly children who, who are facing more challenges than others. Uh, it was, I think, a really useful uh, and helpful in-depth piece of research by the committee, um, and it has been um, sent to us uh, to us as cabinet for response which will come back that is absolutely the sort of thing that um, needs to happen to help cabinet always to focus in the right places and not to miss things that uh, an in-depth piece of work has really pointed up so um, i i think that th this particular scrutiny is well on the way with its reforms and i look forward to the next piece of in-depth work that they wish to do Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Nicholson. Uh, I must also thank the Scrutiny uh, Children and Families Committee for their support and for their uh, dedication to their role and ask that it's noted by Council. I move now to our last report, this item yes, 15. Sorry. I had my hand up as well. Mm. Councillor Perbrick. Oh. Couldn't see her had her hand up. I apologise, Faye, that um, 
it's not come up on our screen and not come up on the chat bar either but go um, ahead sorry it's up on my screen sorry chair um I, i'd just like to reiterate france has got her hand up quicker than me and obviously more visibly than me um she she pretty much said exactly the same as i would uh, have said to councillor redmond i think that the uh, children's scrutiny um panel are doing some amazing work at trying to to drive forward the the scrutiny changes that we've all um, work towards and look forward to some fantastic effort going on by everybody there and from a personal point of view for me I really welcome the um, the fact that we're looking much more at education and not just the uh, the social care side of children's services because I think in the past the uh, children's uh, scrutiny agenda has been slightly uh, more skewed towards that area and it's great to, to have some uh, some scrutiny towards the education side too so thank you. So, item 15, uh, Councillor Claire Paul. Sorry you were delayed there, Claire, and I'd already introduced you, but the floor is now yours. Uh, and the item is for noting only. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I no problem with the delay. Uh, as you say, it's an item for noting, but if I can just pull out a few of the key points, and it would be remiss of me not to reiterate um, our, and of course, my thanks to Trudy and all of the public health team uh, for the work and their efforts. I'd also like to thank Christine uh, and Julia and the government's team behind this board for their support and of course the excellent work that Christine did prior to my appointment. We did welcome four uh, new district councillors to the board following the local elections. We have had a number of development sessions for the board, which have included things like stronger communities and climate change. We've made a conscious decision at the board to have less agenda items than we previously had, simply to allow for more in-depth discussion at the board on the presentations given. However, we've increased the number of written briefings for board members where items were for simply information as opposed to uh, discussions at the board. And of course, thank you to Francis for uh, vice chairing the first one, which I was unable to chair. Happy to take any questions. All right, are there any questions for Councillor Paul, please? Must be some questions for her, come on. Right, I see no questions. She's going to get be let off lightly then, I think, in that case. Uh, Councillor Fothergill, thank goodness. Well, I, I didn't want the moment to go to, without, uh, first of all, saying thank you to Christine Lawrence for everything that she did in the formation of the Health and Wellbeing Board. I know that Claire said thank you, but uh, but Christine uh, was instrumental in bringing the Health and Wellbeing Board together uh, and, and did an absolutely sterling job. And, and I know she knows that it's in good hands with Claire um, and she looks on, but um, but uh, she did she did a really good job for us. So thank you, Christine. And and of all, also thank you to Claire for stepping up and taking on the Health and Wellbeing Board. It seems to be taking on more more and more of an importance and certainly when I talk to anybody in government uh, it seems to be that they see lots of uh, opportunities to develop the health and wellbeing board in terms of uh, where we can go over the next few years so delighted that it's in good hands and thank you for Claire for stepping forward and a big thank you to Christine for everything that she did in setting it up and seeing it through the first few years. Right well Thank you, all councillors. Thank you for the members of the. Sorry, Christine Lawrence wants to say something. Yes, my name. Christine Lawrence, please. Yes, as my name was mentioned, it's most kind of Claire and David, and Claire is settling in very well. They're a great team, public health. I do miss them a little bit, but I just want to say my new team is great too. And uh, whilst I didn't, and I'm not going to go into any details, only to say that uh, just to remind you all that our digital team who did such a good job uh, with coronavirus has been shortlisted for prestigious national awards. So I'd like that to be minuted because these things don't happen very often. And uh, that team in particular worked 
night and day to be sure that everybody that needed help got it appropriately and so i think it's only right that they should get a mention so thank you to all our staff that work in customers and communities the contact center the information governance team and the performance and business intelligence team they have been masterful in looking after our communities thank you right well there being nobody else saying anything other than me now um, it is my uh, great privilege to thank people like Scott and Honor, without whom uh, this meeting would have been very, very hard for me. Scott's definitely my right hand man, having sat on my left, switching on machines and muting me and muting others and bringing them in. And there are people, staff here, working in the background, people like Julia Jones and Mike Bryant and Ollie, the technical uh, team, and all his people, and Jenny Murphy, who's been making jokes about uh, tapes and various other things. Thank you all, because it's those behind the scenes that have made it possible for us to run a public meeting, which is our duty to do for the, for the public of Somerset. Thank you all, and uh, I should look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. I wish you all a good day. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Nigel. <laughs> Come on, go home. <laughs> Thank you. Well done.